uh, helping to recover the conditions down on Charles Street that I was witness to. Um, the conditions two days ago were no, nowhere near as nice as they were today. It was um, eight degrees while, when I was down walking. Um, and it was hard work, and there, there are people out in eight degree weather for eight hours. It takes a bit out of you. I understand there are continued problems in the area, and I believe we'll hear tonight from residents in terms of some of those, but I did want to make a point of commenting about uh, the effort made by both National Grid and our Public Safety and Department of Public Works. With that, I'll turn to my right tonight and op open ask for liaison reports. John? Um, not necessarily liaison report, but um, the Office of uh, Elder Affairs has lost a longtime resident, Ann Gentile has retired, yes. um, and um, visited her retirement party on Monday. Um, great time was had by all. She's off to enjoy her first grandchild and, um, and enjoy her retirement. So I just wanted to thank Ann, um, and I've known Ann for many years. We actually worked together here in Reading 40 years ago, so uh, and, you know, it was it was nice to be able to see her off. And you start together, you end together. Yeah. Um, what, did you, you know something I don't know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Ann, I think, um, had a nice, uh, you know, a nice run here with the town. And um, by all accounts, um, including from Jane, um, she's going to be sorely missed. But um, as she told me, she we have a new volunteer. So Fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Dan. Uh, no report, Mr. Chairman. Barry. Uh, a couple of things, John. Um, like uh, you and, and Andy, uh, I attended the school committee meeting last night. It was their first um, uh, unveil of their budget. Um, Grim is probably, um, my friend Mr. Holmes could probably come up with a better, a better synonym uh, or adjective to really describe the, pro the, the, um, the you know, what was happening there. Um, you know, they've got, they've got a lot of work to do, as we do, um, and I think it's really kind of the, we're really getting into that uh, that part of the year where we're really going to have to buckle down and really make some hard decisions. But um, it, there were not a lot of happy faces over on Oakland Road uh, last night. Um, on another note, um, today um, uh, Bob and um, my, myself attended uh, what was basically the unveiling of um, the signage from our wayfinding working group. You may recall that through the hard work mostly of Julie Mercier, we were able to get a grant, very highly sought after grant, to help us with some wayfinding and branding um, and sort of an sort of urban planning tool. Uh, and so they kind of unveiled what it's going to look like. Um, we walked around the town a little bit to sort of figure out where signs might go. Um, we will be getting a presentation on the 23rd, Bob, I believe. Yes. Um, so that was a really good process because it involved, it really was what you would call a public-private partnership. Obviously town staff involved, public safety, the business community, um, really kind of putting our heads together and sort of figuring out what is Reading, what do we want to, what's our, what, what, what's our statement, and how are we going to get people from here to there. Um, so I, I was really excited about it, it's been going on since the summer, um, and I think you will be uh, delighted when you see the quality of the work that comes here. When do you expect to? Have something to review. Are they coming here on the 23rd? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, was I guess our next meeting. So. Good. Good. Other than that, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I just like Barry. I wanted to echo and maybe add on a little bit. Uh, Barry and John and I uh, were at the school committee presentation last night, uh, the first in one of their three, I think, budget talks this week's, and and as. Uh, someone from the select board I really focused on what their need need ba need needs are for next year um, both in in um, maintaining the school systems and maybe getting back some of the uh, teachers that we've lost over the past five or six years um, and and of course the dollar amount that that would take um, so it was, it was a very interesting presentation pretty clear clear a um, lot of um, easy to read tables and I encourage you to all um, take a look at it when you have a chance. And for those who uh, don't know, there'll be a follow-up meeting tomorrow, Wednesday night and Thursday night, all in the uh, RMHS Scatini Library. Uh, with that, I'll open the floor for public comment. I'm sorry, Bob. John, if, if I might suggest if members are here to listen to the National Grid gas issue, 
we should probably have the chief give an overview yeah, first. That might answer some that of the questions. That might be helpful. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Um, chiefs, or who would like to go first? Sure. I'll be happy to. Um, Thank you. So Friday morning, we uh, <coughs> I became aware that uh, 78 homes lost lost their heat through uh, losing the their uh, gas supply. So because of the temperatures, we're very concerned about um, elderly people in their homes and the, the need to shelter people became a real a real concern. So both the assistant chief and I responded down to the to the scene and met with the uh, supervisor for National Grid. Um, they had they had worked in the overnight and they were awaiting a shift change and a new supervisor was coming on. So um, when the new supervisor came on, they had a plan to dig um, the road. They found gap, they found water in the gas main and that had occluded <coughs> the gas main and stopped the flow of gas. So they needed to open the road up and um, put a camera in to see what the source of that water was uh, coming in. And they also needed to find the leak because there was water coming in, but they also had a, uh, a leak to the pipe. So uh, we let them do their work, and uh, we, we came back down to them about 10.30 that, that morning. And they reported to us that they had the, um, the gas line um, open back up, and um, pe people's heat was going to be restored, and they were going <coughs> to do that. So um, we put out a, um, an Everbridge, uh, I call it Everbridge. Yeah, code, code red. A code red. We put out a code red to, to people so they would be aware gas was coming back on and the national grid was going around and making sure that their, their heat was going to be on. But in the interim between that um, 7.30 in the morning, that 10.30 in the morning, we were working on opening the shelter for people. We were working on getting the senior center open, which meant contacting the BPW to get that parking lot plowed out, uh, facilities to get this, the sidewalk um, opened up, and also the heat turned on in that building. Also coordinated with elder services to call frail elders to make sure that we didn't have an issue with some of our, our frail elders who, that couldn't get in the car and, and couldn't get out of, out of there. So when we learned that the, the, um, the gas was restored, uh, we put out that Everbridge message and, we, and they continued to work. But they told us, and they did, that they were going to stay until they got that problem resolved. Um, and then we touched back with them again that day and then I I went down there again at 7 p.m. that night. They were still uh, working the issue. They haven't, they <coughs> hadn't found the cause of where the leak was or the water entering at that point. But they assured me that uh, everybody had heat and um, they were going to be able to maintain that heat through, through the night. They did have, they did bring in a, um, a truck from uh, Clean Harvest to evacuate the water out. That froze. Um, they, actually had, they actually had to hand pump that water out. They brought another truck in. Friday night and the overnight, um, they weren't able to keep up with it or, or the truck. I think the truck froze truck on the Friday night, so people lost their gas again at 2 o'clock at night. So we became aware of it again that, that people were without, without gas in the morning. So both the assistant chief and I went down there first thing um, Saturday morning. We stayed for the day. Um, and we met with the uh, supervisor continually to find out where they are, with it, where, where they're going to go with it. One of the things that I was speaking to him about, and if he couldn't get the, the gas restored to the people, that, that I wanted to see him, uh, National Grid, put people up in a, in a, in a hotel. So, um, so he said it kind of worked out issue on, on his end. But um, he was able to restore gas back uh, to to people in the morning. He reported to us around 11 o'clock Saturday morning that they restored the gas back and people should have heat and that they would be going around and, and to each of individual home to make sure everything was okay. So we put out another uh, rever another uh, code red message uh, to tell the people that, that they had gas. Unfortunately, between the time that he told me that and the time the message went out, they lost gas again to the area and filled back up with the pipe filled back up with water and, um, and, and they lost heat again. So we immediately put out another code red message. Unfortunately, we're contradicting ourselves at that point. Right? We were trying to get that message out to the people because I know if I was at home and I lost my heat, I'd wonder most importantly, when's that coming back on? And then you can make up some arrangements if you know when it's coming. 
So we put out another code red uh, message um, to let people know that um, that they were the National Grid was on scene and they were working that that issue. Then they got the gas restored again. He felt confident he was going to be able to keep it um, keep those lines open. What time of day was that? That where were you at that point in time? Was that Saturday? That was Saturday about approximately 11 o'clock in the morning. We were on we were on Charles Street. Okay. And they had to open, so they, they opened a hole on Charles Street, um, and, and they had to dig down, find the main, uh, put a saddle around it, drill into the pipe, and then put a camera down. And then they had to put that camera up, up the pipe and, and identify where the source of the leak. The camera goes approximately 250 feet, 300 feet. So they had to continually open the road. So they opened um, Charles at, at Timberneck, and they, they couldn't find the source. Water was continually in that main, so they went up to Wakefield Street, <coughs> Charles and Wakefield. They opened the road there and, and dug down, did the same thing, put the camera down, and that was dry up in that area. So then they know it was between Tamarack and Wakefield Street, so they needed another hole. So at the time, the National Grid felt that was domestic um, water, town water, um, from a water main, getting into that line, so we brought down water department to look for leaks. Um, they, they checked a number of things. They couldn't find a leak. Then when I was on this on Charles Street, one of the residents came up to me and he, he, he told me that he had terrible water pressure. So we found out what his house was and then we brought the water department down to that. National Grid removed um, snow in front of that home and we could see the water bubbling up. Wow. So that indicated where the water leak was. So they, they dug that particular area and then um, they also they found the water leak to the service, and they also found the gas leak. So they're about four or five feet away. Wow. So they were able to, um, through the DPW's equipment, evacuate the water from the hole, make repairs to the gas pipe, and then make repairs to the to the water pipe. So approximately four o'clock that afternoon, they had the source of the of the water leak, and they had the the source of the gas leak contained. And they brought in a lot of crews to go around to the individual homes and restore their gas service to make sure that was restored. So when we left uh, approximately 4 o'clock, everything was, was well underway and, um, and they were backfilling the holes. And we had the DPW sand the road because there was water all over the road. Um, the uh, supervisor told me that you know, one of his concerns was because of all the water in that main that it would freeze at the at the meters. So he said that they would be going along and wrapping those meters with, with heat tape and insulation to, to head that off. So we went through the overnight hours and then I, I got a message from one of the residents on um, Tamarack Road um, Sunday morning indicating that he had um, an issue with his heat, but his elderly neighbor also, um, who was uh, wheelchair bound, also uh, lost heat. So we sent a truck up uh, sent a, an engine and the, ca and the captain up there to uh, meet with that neighbor. He went door to door, identified some other homes that were without uh, gas, and then, we, and then we made sure National Grid came back, and they, they immediately came back with their trucks, and those were issues with gas meters, so they were taking gas meters off and restoring it. Um, they were on scene um, till, you know, I, I spoke to uh, one of the service technicians that was there, at, at four o'clock in the afternoon, and he was sitting in the area just waiting to see if any other um, incidents of, of no heat arose, and then he responded. So he was just sitting there, um, he said, for two more hours, so to about 6 p.m. that night. So, I mean, I, <clears throat> I do know that we sent out some conflicting messages, but we're trying to let the residents know uh, where we were with the, with the process and what was going on as best we could. We also put a press release out on Friday um, to, to let to, to go to local media because the media had picked up the story. So we, we wanted to try to hit those outlets again. With the code red, you don't hit everybody. So, you know, I, when I looked at, I think we sent out six code red messages. There were 78 impacted homes that have gas. Um, we hit, we reached 300 homes. Um, so it, you don't know if you hit every individual person. So you limited it to the target area. Yeah, well, you can geographically identify the areas you want to hit. You don't know who picked up or who received it. Yeah, and you know, with everybody with with, with 
with landlines, you can we can buy lists. The police department buys lists of right. landline phones. But you know, people are transitioning from landline phones to cell phones, and they're not picked up in those lists. So they have to manually opt into those. So you can miss people that way. So that's kind of a flaw in the system. So that's why we use the um, uh, we we put out that press release uh, on Friday. No one on the town's website as well. Those kind of our response. I think National Grid is here. Uh, before, you, before you go any farther, yep. Greg, are there still problems that you know of as we stand here tonight? Well, I know National Grid's gone out. Um, uh, a, a not a, we put out a reverse. Not, a never. A, a code, code, red. <laughs> code red. That's why I came tonight. <laughs> we put out a code red uh, message this afternoon, late this afternoon, to the, to the same areas that we've been peppering with, with these um, messages, asking residents to contact us in National Grid if they have a problem with the, with the heat or the gas service. One of the things that we found out on, on, on Sunday was the, because they had seen so many trucks in the neighborhood, they felt the issue was being worked on, and they didn't, they didn't reach out uh, to us. They didn't want to bother us to, to tell us that. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, so in, uh, I know tonight at, in, in the area of 77 Wakefield Street, we had an order of uh, natural gas in the street. On, on the uh, other side, uh, yesterday, the National Grid got and did a repair to the main on uh, Wakefield Street as well. So, you know, I, I don't think that's related to what's, what the issue is here, but, but they've been working in the area. Good. Thank you. Uh, National Grid, do you have some uh, statements to make this evening? Uh, just first of all, I want to thank the chief. Why don't you come up, introduce yourself, and yeah. my name is Dan Cameron. I'm with National Grid. My <coughs> office is at uh, 170 Memphis Street Mall. And Welcome, Dan. Welcome. I recently took over the, uh, the town of Reading, but I, of which I was not on site. I was dealing with a pretty good-sized uh, gas issue in, in Lynn uh, during that time period, but. Um, I was able to talk to everyone today. I was getting messages, you know, during the during the event, and I spoke to all the supervisors that the chief we've uh, referred to uh, today. And, uh, did a great job. I, mean, I don't think I could have done any better than describing what happened. You all have to see. But uh, you know, we, we eventually got to the source of the problem, which is which is a water leak, which is always a problem any time of year, particularly in the winter. Um, we finally did resolve it. Unfortunately, some. Condensation did get into the pipe as you know, all the water flowing and froze up some meters. Um, and I don't, you know, I know some of you were probably hit three times. I think out of the 70, there were 78 homes uh, services affected in total. And I think over the course of the three days, um, some were affected maybe once, some twice, some three times. Um, but you can see what, what happened here. You know, the first, you know, our first job is to try to <clears throat> get the gas flowing. And at the same time, we had a similar crew as the chief described, trying to find out where the source of the, of the problem was. And I, I think, unfortunately, the gentleman that where the water leak was doesn't use gas. Right. Because right. He didn't if he know. did, <laughs> he maybe we would have known sooner. Right. You know? Exactly. Um, but I, I found that <clears throat> today as well. But I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. So, uh, Dan? Yes. Yes, sir. So are, are you our guy? Are you, uh, our, no, are you our national grid guy? Yes. Okay, Dan is so. a longtime Reading resident. Okay. I'm a resident. And, well, that's that, active that, coach yeah. all through yeah. town. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I know that some of the some of the you know concerns that I had heard was that you know sort of you know our our staff is down there you know that you guys are working really hard together but at a certain point it sort of turned over to you for the customer service piece so. You know, it's the, they can call the chiefs, they can call, you know, town hall, but at a certain point, it's really your, you know, your operation that's sort of handling the phone calls. And, you know, in a time when, you know, there's probably a lot of towns having similar problems, you know, you probably, people are picking up the phones in other areas that might not be, you know, like the, the chief's office isn't picking it up. So it's good that you all have each other's phone numbers because if there's a frustration from people's part about like they're calling National Grid and, they're on hold for a long time, or someone answers the phone doesn't really know what's going on. It would be great that you know Greg or you know someone else would say, "Hey, Dan, you know we got a problem here." You know, he could text you, and you can kind of expedite. I mean, I mean that's kind of obviously you know you want to make it so that you don't really have to come out on these kind of things. You want it to work perfectly, but it never does. 
but there's got to be a way, I think, for our staff, you know, whether it be public works or, or the chiefs, to be able to kind of pick up the phone and reach our guy, right, if our residents are not getting the, you know, they're not getting the answers or they're, you know, they're, they're not, the phone's not getting picked up or, you know, not being serviced. So, you know, kind of the expert, I, I don't know, hopefully you guys have all each other's phone numbers in your cell phone, so um, if that happens so that, you know, at least people can call us and say, hey, you know, we call the guy and it'll be 10 more minutes, it'll be two more hours, and just so people get information. That's helpful. One of the things I heard, Dan, was um, there was at least the implication of a <coughs> lack of communication. I don't, I'm sure we'll, you'll be able to respond to it, but there was genuine confusion as to who to call. Again, I'm just reciting what I heard, but there were folks that called National Grid, got routed to a call center, but didn't have confidence that the call got through or got dispatched back to Boston or whoever was the, the man managing agency. And so there wasn't this sense of closed loop where I make a call, I know I got through, I know the complaint was faithfully recorded, and I know somebody's going to eventually get to it. Is National Grid, in an, uh, these events don't happen that often, and that's good, but when they happen, is there a way that National Grid takes ownership of the public relations part of it? Yeah, a couple of comments on that. Um, this obviously turned into a three-day event, three event, but it was three individual days. We thought thought that we had the problem solved on Friday, and then we we're back this Saturday, and then we we're back this Sunday. Um, if we know it's going to be a multi-day event, we move, or we, we have an emergency operations room. <clears throat> Looks like a mobile home, we would move it right into the site, complete, you know, it's a command center. We have what they call the incident command ICS system that we would institute and kind of take over. This didn't launch that on the first <coughs> day, and then all of a sudden we were, we were in the second day. But uh, what we can do, we have the ability to do as well, is to do a reverse call. So we, we can do that as well. I think we don't want to confuse people, so if the town, and a lot of, I've been involved in a lot of these situations over the years, and sometimes the city or town will take over that, and that's fine, but we have the ability to do that as well. Well, we can send out a message based on the, the same communication that the, the chief had described. You know, we have, we have uh, email, we have, uh, you know, cell phones, you know, the, 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 and even landlines, so we can get a message out to but I think there's two parts. There's the medium part of it, which is Facebook, cell phones, landlines, you know, carrier pigeon. There's all those ways to do it. But then there's also, I know what to say. I have the message. I have the current state. I know what to say. That's the part I think the town can't help with. It's your physical plant. It's your plumbing. You, it's your guys. You guys know the current state, the situational awareness at any point in time. All we're going to have is a version of that. And I think that's, in my sense, where it broke down. We, okay. we had a version of the situation an, an hour or three away. That went out on reverse 911. Oops, we got to do an about face. So we've lost, you know, people walked away with a false sense of security that it was done. And, and again, these things don't happen that often, so it's not as if you can plan for them. But it really goes back to who owns the public relations problem for a gas or a major utility related problem. Is it the town of Reading, which we can help, but I don't think we can ever own the message. No, we, we I mean, the, obviously it's, it's our company, it's our issue, it's our issue to resolve. So we would we would take responsibility for any, for any outgoing messaging uh, involved to the media, you know, because, uh, you know, the media is involved and also, you know, to the, to the town itself. So we, we would have responsibility for that. But I just, you know, I've been in situations where sometimes the city of town wants to take the lead and that's fine. Usually they'll check with us as to the Right. Like, for instance, this incident that I was involved in at Lynn, uh, we controlled the message and we, we told them exactly what we wanted them to say and so forth. Well, we can. A post-mortem might need to get done, just in sort of terms of, sort of, if it happens here again in Reading, the protocol is. Lessons learned. Dump, bump, bump, bump. You know, hopefully it never happens, but, you know, it might. And, and maybe there's some, I mean, you, you do this in a lot of towns, apparently. Yes. Maybe there's some things that you could teach us about based on what other towns are doing because um, you see it all the time we only see it once every generation hopefully but um, you know but you you've got institutional memory whereas we may not if there are no other questions of the board I know there are folks here that want to, that want to speak and maybe get some answers I had a quick question just um, obviously none of us are expert in, in this type of utility work um, and I, I was wondering Going off of what um, uh, Barry, I think, said, a post mortem, is there, 
would you be willing, and Chief Burns be willing to get together and sort of uh, come up with a plan moving forward for if this happens again, houses lose heat in such frigid cold um, that you, you decide what's, whatever is best for the town. Um, there's one number that people can call or one website that people can go to for up-to-date information. Um, because I think it was it was scary. We got an, we all got an email from uh, a, a woman with a young infant uh, um, who who it sounds like still doesn't really know whether or not the problem's been resolved. So um, sort of a central command center um, that people could call and get information from. Um, decide that could you decide that. <coughs> soon <coughs> down the road so um, we have just either the town or, or, or the gas company uh, filling the calls. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I will say that you know, National Grid, uh, we're also in the electric business. I actually came up on the electric side of mm -hmm. the business. Um, so you may know that we uh, purchased Keyspan about uh, 10 years ago, so now we're doing gas and electric. But what you're referring to um, happens a lot more on the electric side. Mm -hmm. We have to set up uh, command centers and so forth, particularly with storms. You know, we, were, we actually had a you know, good-sized storm this past week as well. So we are used to that on the, on the electric side. And I can certainly share those experiences and whatever we can do to make sure we have you know, the proper communication and channels and everything. So okay. Does that sound it does not happen that often on the gas side. Right. Does that sound reasonable, Chief? Or? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I think I think the the big issue was from um, some of the residents didn't feel that they got um, maybe closure to the incident, mm -hmm. or so because we did send Everbridge messages out con continually. I think we yeah. sent code red. We sent code red, red messages out. I think we sent six of them over the, mm -hmm. over the weekend. So yeah. um, I I think. You know, in, in hindsight, you know, perhaps a, 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 a final closure mm -hmm. and a final closure press release, you know, on, that we could distribute yeah. uh, both on the, the websites and through social media outlets. I think that probably was the missing piece okay. because, you know, where, you know, the issues with the, with the freezing, um, meters and things like that. I think that probably should have responded to that. I think that, I think we'll hear tonight whether it, whether or not that would have kind of solved the issue for the residents or not. Okay, thanks. Well, we did have very good contact with National Grid, with the supervisors and, and things like that. So, if, you know, I wanted to know what was going on. I was able to just go right down there and talk to the person that was, who was, who was running. And he was very, you know, we dealt with two supervisors because of shift change and things. And they were both forthcoming with what they were dealing with and what they thought it was and you know where they saw it going. But you know, at, at the time, you, they didn't know where it was going until they found that leak and found that water source. Any other questions before we open it up for public comment? Public comment, if you'd like to speak, just raise your hand, stand and introduce yourself and tell us what's on your mind. Hi, I'm Kristen Coppice. I live on Timberneck Drive. Um, we were on the farther end of the where the <coughs> gas um, the gas went out. So what I understand is the gas comes down Wakefield, down Tamarack, loops under Timberneck, and there's only a few houses that have gas. So we didn't really get to see a lot of the trucks coming by. We had a lot of issues um, contacting National Grid. I am actually the uh, woman who sent the email today. I have a one-year-old. She's sick. Um, I called Thursday night, I called the fire department Thursday night at 10 o'clock and I reported a no gas. I was told that National Grid was going to respond between the hours of 8 and 12 and that I should wait for them. Very frustrating. And I said, well, what do I do? I have a sick one-year-old. What do you suggest? Should I leave? Well, if you feel that you should leave, you should leave. Not really the response I was hoping to get from the fire department. And, and Chief and I spoke today, you know, perhaps there was a miscommunication somewhere. But from my point of view, the fire department knew Thursday night. Um, and the fact that they had acknowledged someone had called before me, you know, someone clearly knew. 
Um, so we had heat intermittently. We had no heat Thursday night. We had to walk across the street, dog and child towed to a neighbor who had oil, who graciously let us sleep on their couch while my husband stayed home. We had heat restored Friday afternoon. Um, Friday afternoon, it was, it was come and go. My husband actually had to call National Grid because they kept walking by our house. He called and they said, we don't have a ticket for you. And he said, what do you mean? I called Thursday night, I have a one-year-old. And they said, oh, sorry, um, you're not even in our system. But someone had, he had actually spoken to someone Thursday night because he chased a, man, a National Grid worker down the road. They had no ticket, they had to put us back in the system. Clearly, you know, fr it's very frustrating. And I was, you know, trying to relocate my family to stay somewhere warm, my parents' house and whatnot. Um, and then finally, you know, we got heat back, goes out again early Saturday morning. And at the same time, we get a notice from, you know, Code Red saying heat is restored and we have no heat. And then we get another one saying it's not. So again, frustrating, a very stressful situation with radiators, pipes freezing, negative 20 degree uh, wind chills. Um, the gas did come back Saturday afternoon. There was a national grid worker chipping ice off my meter. He said that my line was not uh, clear and that some of the pressure was low, but thankfully we have a newer boiler. So we didn't have a running pilot. So it would just restart and it could set itself. My neighbor across the street had National Grid come in five times Friday night to relight her boiler because the pilots weren't running, people were losing heat. Thankfully, we have had heat since Saturday night, but according to the tech who came to my home, he said he cannot guarantee that it's going to last through the week. As the thaw happens, they're concerned, this is coming from the workers on the street, that there's going to be more water, that the lines are going to continue to freeze, and that my meter could still freeze when the temperatures drop. So whether or not they send out something, I honestly don't believe that the issue is resolved. And it's a concern for us because I have a, ch a young child at home. I work locally. I can't be running around. So I have to say I don't have much faith. I do appreciate, you know, sort of a post-mortem and what to do in the future. But what are we going to do right now? Because there are still national grid crews out on Charles Street. They're driving down Timberneck Drive, Tamarack, Wakefield. Um, we still smell gas. It's not, uh, I don't think it's done. And I'm sorry, but I don't, I don't believe that it's done. So um, I also wanted to note that yesterday, and I, you know, again, I spoke with the chief earlier today, but there are some neighbors who weren't able to come tonight, and so I wanted to speak on their behalf. I had a neighbor who did not have heat yesterday. The temperature was 47 degrees in the home. Uh, they called the fire department. The fire department said, or the dispatch perhaps, as the, the chief and I spoke this afternoon, but the, the woman on the phone said, it's not our problem, call National Grid. She called National Grid and was put on hold for 25 minutes. And then she finally um, got through to someone by running down the street to a crew member and said, hey, I have no heat. Can you help me? Sure, you're second on our list. We'll just, we'll just come in. Last night they had their meter replaced, and they fortunately have heat at least tonight. Called the town manager's office today, and the individual that she spoke with hung up on her. So I don't think that um, is a very good form of communication. The lines of communication need to stay open between residents in the town, the fire chief, and national grid. Um, it's just not acceptable as a town resident to be hung up on by your town manager's office. So, you know, I agree we need a plan of action. I think we need to have a direct line for National Grid. We can't be on hold. So, and I appreciate all of you and your, your concerns, um, but, you know, I don't think the issue is resolved, and I am concerned going forward. Dan, with regard to the, it might come back, or you've got some residual material in the pipe, <coughs> and therefore risk when the temperatures drop, is there a different path to notify National Grid, because this is now a continuing, it's a chronic problem, it's no longer a one-off. Is there a different path of notifying National Grid? Fortunately, the, the only residence is just is, is the heat on I'm sorry, say that again? <coughs> for, for, for residents to contact National Grid is, is to call the, the customer service number, which is, you know, open 24-7 um, if, if, they, if they continue to have an issue. Is there an expedited process because it's a chronic problem, or is yes, it? Yes, yes, and, and to what you said earlier about we continue to monitor the situation out there. Um, we had an unrelated problem here today. But this is, you know, a, a, you know, a heightened, heightened aware the awareness within the company. We have, we're confident that the water is out of all the pipe. Um, I'm not sure what the tech was referring to, but um, you know, we we know that the water leak caused the cast iron pipe to actually undermine and act because the, the, the leak in the, in the pipe was only a few feet away from where the water leak was. So, you know, we're confident that we've resolved where this problem started. Uh, we are taking a look at um, possibly replacing pipe. You know, our long-term goal is to replace all cast iron pipes throughout the state of Massachusetts. 
there's a lot of it out there. You know, the infrastructure in Massachusetts is very old. Um, so in, in what we're replacing with is plastic. It's our fact we have projects already ongoing you know, within the yeah. community. We might accelerate that. But narrowly well. around the problem at hand. Yeah. 1-800 if they smell gas, 1-800 if the meter freezes, 1-800 if there's no heat. That's correct. Is there a case number they should refer to so to get that expedited, this is not a new problem, this is an extension? No, no particular case number, it's just a, you know, whatever, whatever address that they're calling from. Eric. Yeah, um, so we now know there's about 70, 80 houses sort of involved. It's fixed for the most part, but we are expecting a freeze which could actually you know, make the problem worse. So I'm really concerned for, for her family with a one-year-old. Can you just sort of say, you know, if, it, if it's three in the morning and it happens, right, or, or you know, 11 o'clock at night, can you basically guarantee that, say, okay, get out of your house, go to the Hilton, you know, we'll put you up until we fix it, because now, you know, you're not guaranteeing it for the whole neighborhood. It's really only half a dozen, maybe 10 houses. So this way, if they, they call and they can't get, at least they know, Okay, we'll get out, and, and the gas company will take care of it. Can you guarantee that? Can you? Can, I don't know what you can every, say, every, but yeah, every situation regarding that is different. You know, um, we have done that in the past. Um, if this if this problem continued, uh, it was more serious. You know, multi-day event. Um, perhaps we would have we, we would have we would have uh, we would have considered that. But I, I can't I can't say right now that I absolutely can say go to a hotel if this happens again. Um, we'd have to. You know, we, you know, we are. Uh, what I can suggest is that pe perhaps when the temperatures do, um, do start to, we do have people on 24/7, but we stay close to this ready situation so that we're aware, you know, that you know something could happen, and, <coughs> and uh, we don't think it will. But if it does, we're we're ready to respond. Any other public comment? Yes. Hello, my name is Kathy Donnelly. I live at 246 Charles Street. I got to know the WG for quite a bit um, Saturday. Um, I'd like to underscore without repeating, if I could, first of all, um, I will say that the National Grid teams that were out there, we called uh, National Grid at 845, 9 o'clock on Thursday night. So that's when we realized that we had been out of gas. Um, they were at our house at 10 p.m., back again at 2 a.m. The, the folks that we dealt with were wonderful. They, they were very clear and did communicate what what they were researching and, and even said I, you know what they didn't know so um, I can't comment on that um, two points I think the chief you mentioned the comment about the code reds feeling I think that it's not really closure they just felt completely unreliable and where I mentioned where I live those photos I live right there where the water was broke it felt as though the message hadn't didn't agree with what was actually happening at that point in time so I think our confidence was tested in that regard. So I think that your comments, um, you sir, about how the status is, is good to hear, and everybody would like to know that. Because if you're in day five, so Thursday night, Friday night, and certainly the frigid temps are adding an elevation of concern, but day five or six, every time there's a national grid truck now, everybody's very concerned what's going on, they're patching, it's not a new issue. Or, you know, are um, people having um, gas issues because of more blockages and freezing meters? Um, so, you know, how it comes together as your post-mortem or how these code red calls um, go out, that created um, a sig significant level of concern. The callbacks that I made to National Grid, I didn't call because I didn't smell gas, I didn't call our fire department, I called the service provider. Um, Saturday morning, when I called Thursday night, the person was direct, clear, yes, I've gotten many calls from your street, you should expect a team out there very soon. That was the 8.45, 9 o'clock call. The knock on the door came at 10 p.m. So our experience was, um, I guess I would call a very rapid response, if, especially given the uh, snow at that point. Um, but Saturday morning, when we went out again on Friday night, so um, that was a different situation. Maybe Saturday's calls get routed because it's a weekend. New York didn't want to talk to us, just needed Massachusetts. So that 1-800 number goes directly to New York first. So you, you got to realize when you're on the other line, that's just not acceptable. The, um, the time of out of gas is a little longer than I heard tonight, and I think that that should be acknowledged. And that's why it started Thursday night. So when you and your team became aware of it, we'd all been th going through it for 12, some odd, 15 hours, call it. So it's still at that point, it still hadn't had a resolution. 
and then the resolution was temporary as, as, as we've all gone through it. So I felt that um, we, didn't, we didn't really feel our town was there. It was always, it was National Grid until Saturday morning, very early with the water department. They weren't really visible as a resident, um, quite frankly, until Saturday. It was, it was very much an active all hands. Um, clearly everybody was involved at that point. But Friday restored and then out by five, six, personally I was until probably 8, 30, 9 o'clock. We saw the fire, excuse me, the police cars, the, the road closures, and National Grid. So we didn't hear out that there was a problem again after we were told it was fixed by our town because that was how it was communicated. And then we were waking up and still cold again. And it was still National Grid giving us information or, you know, trying to say we're working on it. So. Um, there was more time out of gas, and we, I think we could have, we would have, would have wanted to see the town there a little more, or at least a communication from the town that we are involved and we'll let you know <clears throat> versus it being fixed. So um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Yes, sir. Sure. Hi, uh, my name's Gary Baker. I live on Evergreen Road. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for allotting probably more of your agenda than you had intended uh, for us to be able to hear from the chief from National Grid and from the residents. So, you know, we certainly appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I have much of the same story that Kristen and Kathy just shared. I could repeat everything that the chief had just said, so I'm not going to. Thursday at 8 o'clock, we started have, having issues, and you know, it just progressed throughout the weekend. Um, I want to say, uh, from a personal perspective, the men on the street, men and women on the street, were fantastic, both from National Grid from the town of Reading, from the fire department and from uh, our police department. I was out there, s I woke up Saturday morning and I got about halfway down my stairs and realized we were out, out of heat again because I could feel the change in temperature from step three to step five. Um, had breakfast, took my time, waited for something to happen, nothing happened, called National Grid and we'll talk about that, um, Mr. Cameron, in a moment. Um, but I went for a walk with my dog because the only way that I was going to get reliable information was to talk to to talk to the cops doing the detail and to talk to the guys digging the holes. And that's how I got my information. Not from the night, from Code Red so right. or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, so, so that's how I got my information and I was able to share it with uh, a subset of my neighbors on a text message and on Facebook. So fortunately we had that. And John, that predated or pre-timed you being uh, anywhere close to on the scene to be completely honest. Um, so I want to make sure that we acknowledge that the men and women that were on the ground did a great job and they battled the elements as best they could because it was two degrees, like I said, two degrees Saturday morning when I went out. The other thing I, w I, I want to acknowledge on, on a positive is um, our neighbors. You know, we all moved to Reading for a reason. The neighbors in the, in the area, in the immediate area, save for one or two, were actually phenomenal. Um, banded together, people were offering space heaters, we borrowed space heaters. Hey, North Reading Lumber has space heaters. We we're all keeping each other informed as best we could. So from a town perspective, from that side of things, we did great. Um, I do have some concerns, um, and they rest, again, some, you know, sometimes with, with, with the 911 calls, I felt like at times we were back on the Abe Lincoln back in 2003 with a mission accomplished banner behind us, <laughs> because we claimed that it was fixed, and it wasn't. So you know, we, we've, we've already put that on the record. We're not going to do that. Uh, Dan, the call center in Brooklyn, was for me hit or miss, it was 50-50. Uh, Thursday evening, great lady on the phone, I wish I could remember her name because she was fantastic. Yeah. Um, I was probably 12th to 13th to call in, she knew exactly what was going on, she handled it beautifully. They'll be there by midnight, call us back if you need anything else going on. Called at 3 a.m. because National Grid didn't come to my house at that point. Got, I got a gentleman on the phone, he was fantastic. Every other person I talked to down there, one was named Tina, one was named Sabrina, did not comprehend the magnitude of the situation or our frustration. And told one, one of, it was Sabrina who told one of my neighbors, um, that issue's been resolved, call back, call the main line after eight. This was Saturday morning when it was, again, two, two degrees. So from your call center's perspective in Brooklyn, they didn't, Either information wasn't passed on from shift to shift, like it could have, should have been, or they just didn't want to hear from us anymore. I don't know what reality is, but like I said, it was 50-50, some great, 
and some on the complete opposite end of the spectrum. So I think that from a, from a retraining point, point of view is something that needs to be brought up within the call center and national grid. I do want, I, I know I'm taking up probably more time than you want, but I do want to raise a few additional concerns. You say that the problem is fixed. We're all skeptical. We want to know, is it truly fixed? And is it fixed permanently? Because we're in, it's January 9th. There are another three months of cold, <coughs> harsh weather that we're looking we're all on pins and needles. There's a truck, uh, one of the trucks is at the corner of Charles and Wakefield right now, poking around someone's foundation. We're, we see the yellow lights come up the street. We're on pins and needles because we don't know if our gas is gonna go up again. Um, today's not so bad. Um, it's about as warm outside as my sunroom was inside Friday morning. Um, so so, so you know, we're very concerned that it's gonna happen again. Um, my neighbors who have outside gas meters have their meters wrapped in heat tape. That's a temporary fix, and I think we all know that. In fact, National Grid told my neighbor across the street that they're gonna come back in three weeks and remove her, her heat tape. Then what? Okay. So, I mean, three weeks from now is the end of January. We still have February and March, and we know what the weather can be in March. Uh, and then moving forward, um, National Grid needs to have some kind of alert when someone from 942 or 944 calls in or uh, has a National Grid account tied to this particular neighborhood. So that when we call in, it flags history of major issues in this area and it needs to be addressed correctly, politely, rapidly, and with the respect that we feel that we should be getting. Since we're all been, you know, we're paying for National Grid. I've been in town for 20 years. I've been in my current house for 14 years. I paid you guys a lot of money. I expect to, I expect to be respected when I call in for, for, you know, for an issue. Um, I'll give you one one last anecdote. I called your emergency line. It must have been Saturday afternoon. I was told because I didn't smell gas, it wasn't an emergency. I explained to the woman, I've been without heat for the last more time in the last 36 hours than I've had heat. My heat, my get my gas is out. This is an emergency. And when she pushed back. You know what I did? I smell gas. And she said, okay, I'll have somebody come over within the hour. I had to lie because they weren't responding. This was, again, either Tina or Sabrina, I don't know which one at this point. But I had to do that because I needed somebody at my house to at least look at it and make sure that I was ticketed and that you guys knew that I was out of gas, but they weren't listening. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you very much. With uh, just triggering off that, Dan, is there a way we can get us, if, if it's already developed, fine, if not, is there a way we could get a current, a current state of what's going on right now, the status, what remaining work tickets is, that you know of are, are yet to be executed, when do you think they'll be complete? Just some sense of progress and uh, for the community. I think you know, synthesizing what I'm hearing here, it's, it's re regaining the trust and regaining an awareness of the status and the, the time to done. Um, as of today, you know. Not, not right now, but okay. you know, within the next 24 hours, 12 sure. hours. Sure. Yep. Yep. I mean, have to, we have to keep in mind that, you know, this, this was a water leak, all right? So we're dealing with a problem that happened, and we think it's solved. Um, yeah, we, yes, we're absolutely at a, a critical time of the year. Um, through the cameras, what the, the chief described, you know, we're confident of all that water is out of the, out of the system in that area. Um, could there be, obviously, some, some condensation um, exposed itself on Sunday and blows up some of these meters based on the, the temperature and so forth? I mean, right now, we're, as, with all the tools that we have, we're confident that we have all the moisture and, and, you know, out of those lines. Um, that's where we stand right now. Now, we will continue to, uh, to monitor the situation very closely because it's not often that water gets into a gas line. It's a rare occurrence, but it's a serious occurrence. So we will, you know, be monitoring this very closely, especially as the temperatures get lower, you know, probably starting next week. So, but I would certainly, uh, <coughs> Chief, I don't know, uh, I can, communicate through you or whoever, you know, tomorrow we can, you know, um, this, this issue is continually being talked about at the company, believe me, it's not, you know, just because we may have, most of the crews have vacated the area, we have, you know. But again, I think there's two points. One is that yeah. there's activity internally, and I get it, and I, I appreciate and trust that. I think there's evidence of that outside the company for those that are customers and using the product, that they know that that's happening and have confidence that it's getting to done. Is there any way that either a state, the current state as of you know, Tuesday, a 
for Wednesday morning can be stick can be made, and just some view of what the next few days might be. I, I don't think it has to be terribly long, but it has to no. show some sense of progress. You want us to communicate through the town? I, yeah, through public yeah. safety. Okay. Sure. Yeah. We can we can do that tomorrow. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And right. somehow communicate it out to the residents. Or, or you could give out your cell number. That would tell yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> as long as the chief has. I'll get it from Chris. Any other comments? Yes. Just to that point, my name's Demetra. I was nowhere near this. I live on the other side of town. I'm sorry you're going through this. When we had issues on Oak Street because there was a big sidewalk and water main and everything was being done, a contact sheet was made of all of the homes on Oak, and it was shared with the various people in charge, water and I don't know who else was involved. And that was a great way, so we got communicated with very efficiently. And that might help. 78 houses contact sheet that you can then deal with. I don't know. Yeah, we've, um, we've done that in the past. Uh, again, this was a... I know, you were yeah, trying to catch it, up. It, you know, let me give you an example. Um, if, if, if power were out, and we knew it was going to be three, four days before we could get power back, we would institute that right away. But I think, you know, we were confident on Friday that everything was all set. And then, it, you know, just... We, we are where we are. We can't change history. But the thought is, can we recover a bit in terms of reestablishing trust in the utility? Just give folks a status, a sense of when it's completed. I don't think it has to be exhaustive. And then, we'll, you know, if, if folks have additional comments, you know, we'll work through public safety and let you know. We know where to find you. I would like to make sure that we, we don't have any lingering bad blood with the residents in town hall. So, if the, 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 you said you're neighbor contacted uh, somebody in town hall and got disconnected or something happened. Um, it, if you could get that straightened out, um, talk to Bob and, and so that there's no ling lingering. Yeah, I think that's important. Lingering um, bad blood. I also had one question to go off on Mr. Berman's question about hotels. I think not only I, but some other neighbors might have incurred expenses related to this. You know, we are I'm going to get a gas bill next month, and I still have to pay it. But I also had to go out and spend a few hundred dollars on some pretty large heaters to warm my home to prevent my radiators from bursting. So where do I send those bills? Because I don't think I should have to incur it. It was not my fault. And I think that the residents, um, perhaps we can, I don't know if there's an answer to that today, or, uh, but I don't think I should have to incur that. Yeah. There is, there is a claims process within the company. Okay. Um, on the number of the top. Call in. Yeah, if you uh, could just let the chief know yeah, that. Yeah, so so if, if I may, when I was on the phone with one of the nice, uh, nice, the nice uh, <laughs> helpful, helpful <laughs> folks, they gave me the claim number, but they wouldn't um, promise, guarantee, whatever you want to call it, that they would cover the claim. Is there a yeah. magic number, a magic word, a magic phrase that we should be putting Perhaps on those claims. Smell gas, which seemed to work. Dan Cameron Dan. said that. Uh, I will not, uh, I will tell you, this. well, they'll yeah. know we're a regulated company. Yes. We're regulated by the Department of Public Utilities. Yes. Their rules and regulations as to when we reimburse people for expenses are very clear. So I, I'll just leave it at that. So I, I can't say. Because I don't work in the claims department, but all I can say is, you know, share the number and, and you know, you're, you're free to, you know, put together your, your expenses and, and, and make the claim. Thanks. Any other comments? Yes. So I have one that's not related to this, but I don't want to move on if people aren't ready. Are we moving Any on? Any other comments on uh, the natural gas discussion or national grid or the town's response? If not, I'll dismiss the chiefs and. Dan, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Demetra Tsekras. I live on Oak Street. So I have a concern, and it's about not, not this at all. It's about campaigning and governing. And I'm glad that I know later, I know, I know later you're talking about your policies. Um, and this is related to that, but not entirely so. Um, three concerns in particular. This is very uncomfortable to talk about. I'm into campaigning, and other people in this room are into campaigning, and it can get ugly. Governing and campaigning need to be separated, and I'm feeling like they're not. A couple of examples. This year, like the year before, and probably years before that, although I don't know, the current chair 
is serving during his final year of his term. And that means, predictably, that he's running. And that means, in my opinion, that by ignoring that policy, or if you voted outright, one of you didn't, ignoring that policy puts into peril the sort of separation that we really want to keep between campaigning and governing. Um, at a meeting at the Board of Selectmen here a couple months ago, the current chair launched his re-election campaign. And that's not right. I have no idea if it's illegal. I have no idea if it breaks some sort of law. But I just know it's not right. Because that's not the business of this board. So that's an example of where it's probably very difficult to maintain that separation. And nonetheless, there it went. And not only was that sort of announced, there was a lot of talk about it. That was a couple months ago. And then just recently on Facebook, and this now we're into social media, which is a mess, um, or can be. The current chair's re-election campaign Facebook page posted to a variety of Reading pages that a lot of people here probably follow, like I do, about the half hour meeting before the meeting tonight, open hours, you guys call it. And it was, it was misleading because it implied that as part of his re-election, he was sitting for half an hour before this meeting and invited people to come and talk to him. When in fact, all of you do those open hours on a rotating basis. So when Oak Street was going through its nightmare and a couple of representatives from our neighborhood came and spoke, Mr. Ensminger was on duty that night and he listened to the complaints and he jumped into the fray and he helped solve the issues. And that's, you know, your job. And we are all grateful to you for doing your job, but it's your job. It's not where you get to campaign. And campaigning in a public building, it's very tricky. So I'm going to ask you to follow your policy. There was sort of a quote from um, Pirates of the Caribbean, as well as our lawyer, who said it's more of a guideline. <laughs> and it's not. It's a policy that the board made. So I suggest you follow it going forward. And I suggest it very strongly. Secondly, I suggest you have a really serious discussion about social media and come up with a really good policy because it's very easy to screw it up, especially if you're not really good at social media and people of a certain age might not be very good at social media. I'm saying that about myself. And then finally, the um, fiery person in me considered asking you to step down effective immediately. But I think it would be irresponsible because you're in the mid middle of a big budget situation, the override, there's a lot going on. So I think it would be irresponsible. So the responsible part of me won't ask for that. But I feel that strongly about keeping this stuff separate. If you're in your final term, you shouldn't be the chair. Since, so. I, since I'm the subject of all of those topics, I'd like well, a few minutes to respond. Because I, I spoke to about campaigning and government. No. Yeah. A fact-based <laughs> response. Can I steal the uh, projector button? Uh, yeah, how do you want to do it? Just click me on. How do I do that? Uh, just give me the light control. This one here. Yes, please. of the last 17 years. In 2011, the policy changed, the practice changed from chairs being selected in June to chairs being selected in April. That was before I was on the board. From 2000, sorry, from 2000 to 2017, I've cataloged who the chair was, shown here by an asterisk, and whether or not they served in their last year. The policy that you speak of has been in practice since prior to this day. In, in years when the board did reorganize in June, the policy was observed less than half the time. 
the policy exists for one purpose, pur purpose primarily, so that town meeting has the stability of a chair, such that after the election, the chair is not ousted, and then you suddenly have the state of the town or the need for the individual who's been speaking for the entire year to be able to present the town meeting. If you reorganize in June, you know, and the chair doesn't serve, you know safely that there's no way for the chair to be ousted. We reorganize now in April and have for the last six years. There's no opportunity, therefore, for, uh, other than the fact that the individual has three or four weeks to produce the state of the town, there's no opportunity for the role of chair to be interrupted with a, a three-month um, ad hoc appointment to cover and then a reorganization in June. Since 2011, we have reorganized in April, and in each of those years, the chair has served in their last year. And prior to that, even when the chair reorganized in June, the policy was observed less than half the time. The need disappeared in 2011. Even when the need was there, it wasn't observed. That, that's just facts. I went back and looked. Yeah, thank you, because I didn't, and I didn't know the history of this. So may I ask a question about this? Sure. So I'm guessing then that when you do talk about policy, you're going to argue that it's an obsolete one. I don't know what we'll say. That's the board's okay. judgment. So then what is so bad if the chair is not reelected? The, the issue is if the board reorganizes in June, I'm sorry, in, in June, and the chair serves in the last year. When April comes around the next year, and the, if the chair is not reelected, you have a period from April whenever to the June right. that you've got to fill with a brand new chair. Right. Presumably but you reorganize in April. Pardon me? But you reorganize in April. And the board has, since 2011, reorganized in April. I, I knew no other method but that. I didn't, at the right. time, understand about the history of this particular topic. Right. So the policy of not electing a chair in their third <coughs> year of their term makes even more sense because you reorganize in April, right? No, because you're guaranteed that in April you have a new chair. We reorganize immediately after the election. Okay. If it was in June, you'd have a three-month period with a brand new individual. If it's in April, you start faithfully every April. There's no situation where you have a temporary assignment. You have somebody there serving for 12 months. I think Demetra's point may, might, I think, I, 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 pardon me if I'm yeah, not I'm interpreting. Not making it. I think Demetra's point is that um, going forward in, in, in um, when, when the board, if the board reorganizes in April and the person who was elected chair is in the last year of their term and presumably runs again, there runs the risk of a perception problem that the chair may use his or her um, role as the chair for an unfair advantage and therefore it looks, you know, it, it, it doesn't look good. Am I, did I capture that well? Yes. But doesn't. this is the first time, to yeah. my knowledge, and I've been through a number of these seasons that this issue has ever been raised. This issue in my six years yeah. has never been even. I, I've never heard that raised ever. But that doesn't mean it's a, it's an irrelevant issue. No, but it's never been raised. So before. I mean, but 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 John, if I could, to Demetra's point, um, you know, this is a board, you know, both here and on maybe on Oakland Road, that you know, if you read all the comments in social media and all the stuff that we got on our own survey, we're laboring under a trust problem, and so therefore we have to do everything that we can to assure the public that we have the best interests of the public in mind. And so having a policy that we haven't paid attention to, right, one of two things happens is that we're telling people we don't care about our own policies, which therefore creates a trust problem in my mind, or we should just basically scrap what we have and try to look at it again. And just, Dimitri, I hope you stay around and hope folks, I, I, I have a number of proposals that we're gonna make, you know, that I'm gonna try to make going forward about Article One that addresses some of these things, that tries to get at what's the best way to govern ourselves, both internally here as, as a board, um, and also how we perceive that, you know, how we are perceived to the public, right? And you know, if you look at Article One, which is our policies, half of it deals with um, paper correspondence, <laughs> 17 pages of letterhead and all kinds of stuff. You look at this, and it's like. It was a great intent when we did it, but it needs to be totally looked at. And you know, having a social media policy, your point about sort of you know uh, someone who's running for re-election posting from their campaign page, you know, kind of having it murky. 
it makes it murky in some ways only because we don't have our own policy at all. This board, does, this board has no way of communicating to the public right now other than sometimes we'll ask Bob for, you know, for the town page to put something out. This board internally as a board has not been able to communicate with the public and also going back to the survey when we asked what is the way that you get your information most about what's going on in town? The least, bar, no, the, the, the lowest bar from my elected officials. Now I look at it as we have an opportunity here to really, um, to really help and communicate as much as we can to get into people's living rooms, to get onto their phones, and really talk about what we're doing here in the town of Reading. That has to come from the board of selectmen, not from me as one selectman or Mr. Arena, a, a selectman and a candidate for re-election, because that just makes things really murky. So stick around, please. I, ho I hope we're going to have a good discussion on, um, on just sort of how to make this work better. So, but on the but thank you for bringing it up. And if I could say something just one briefly, moment, John. Andy. One moment, Andy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your central thesis is the hypothesis that there's, I'm sorry? What? Your central thesis is that there's something un untoward about or unbecoming about the conduct. All of us, like you, are ordinary citizens. We're not special. We just have a bit more time on our hands or an interest in the subject matter. I like what I do. One of the opportunities Facebook had, and LinkedIn and uh, Twitter and texting have given us is a unique opportunity to reach out to individuals that 15 years ago didn't exist. And it's really paid dividends. We heard moments ago about a discussion about a natural gas issue. We probably had more dialogue on Facebook on that one topic than I've seen. I bet there was over 150 comments when you add them up across all the various threads. So there is a real opportunity to use that. Um, I do think that there is value in having a chair communicate. And I do think there is value in any re-election campaign to use that same vehicle. We don't check our First Amendment rights at the door when we take office, and we don't check them when we take the chairmanship position. And as long as there's a clean delineation, I think, I think we can find a happy medium in the middle. Yes, Mitra. Oh, Andrew. Oh, um, on, on a slightly different tack, um, what, something you said to Mitra, uh, raised a, a question in my, in my mind and, and and that's a little different from what we've been talking about you said you had you had contemplated in asking John to step down to avoid the appearance of uh, or, or, or to get back in line with our priorities but you you were reluctant to do that because we were gearing up for an override and budget discussions and things like that and and I think what that made me ponder is the role of the chair in, in, in on a five-person board of selectmen that doesn't have a first selectman. It has five people and a chair. And, and what what role do we want the chair to be? I mean, I, I think the way it's described in the policies, and there's nothing in the in the in the bylaw or the town charter that I can find out on this. Is the role sets uh, the chair? Excuse me. The role of the chair is to set the agenda. Um, and, and to call meetings, and, and, and that's that's about it. So I think um, we we want to think hard on you know making sure that the, the role of the chair remains that um, or not, and then and uh, develop our policies accordingly. So, so you're saying like an equal of five? That's what yeah, I, th I think we're a board of five, not a board of, of uh, yeah. yeah. And none of us speaks for the board. Uh, right. One of the right. one of the great tendencies is to speak as if you were in front of the five in public, and in fact, yes, that, that's that's a common and natural error, and it's yes. one that gets us into trouble. So. Yes. Any other public comments, Bob? I just want to make one comment on this, um, Dimitri. I will say, to this board's credit, or at least a year and a half ago, um, they started attacking the fact that these policies haven't been reviewed for twenty or twenty-five years. So I'll give them credit for that. And you know, as John just showed with the chart, I'm sure there's lots of inconsistencies. Um, we've been through the general bylaws, the charter. You know, a lot of things haven't really been done in 20 years and need to be done a little more often than that. So at least I'll give the board credit for saying, look, we've got to spend some time on this. And what they decide is what they decide. But I, I will say, well in advance, they recognized if you're going to have policies, you ought to follow them or change them. 
and that's been the mantra through all of our written documents, is if that's what the Charter says, we should do it. If we don't like what it says, we should change it. So at least that process has started. Yeah. Major. Uh, just, I, I agree, and I appreciate that. I would push back a little bit on the notion that I'm the only person who's ever thought that this was a concern, because I can assure you I'm not the only person who ever thought this was a concern. But I do have the courage and not enough manners sometimes so that I speak up about it. But thank you. I appreciate it. I wish I could stay, but I've, I've just got places to be. Okay. So good well, it'll be on YouTube, you. so. All right. <laughs> Any other public comment before we move on? All right. Bob? Just two things. Uh, actually, just one thing. We'll deal with the other one later. Um, the library trustees have uh, formally requested uh, to be on your agenda at the next meeting to appoint a library trustee. So we have two applications so far, and the board would like to meet approximately at 715, and I'll confirm that with Amy uh, this week. Does that, does that require us, too? Or yes. is it just yeah. not, I just, it's The a, article in the paper was totally erroneous. Okay, yeah, I read something differently. I didn't yeah. see and the And there are no interviews paper. going on by no. other than this committee right. of the whole. Yes, and Amy checked the last time you did it. It was, uh, I, I don't want to try to remember, I think it was John Brzezinski. Um, it was uh, five selectmen and five trustees, yep. just like the school committee. Yep. They have the same number. Yep. You meet as a group of the whole, mm -hmm. the majority of the ten appoint uh, someone. And they have two applicants, you said? And, and so far I'm aware of two applications. But just so you're aware of that, and What's I'll confirm What's the meeting it. date again, please? That's your next meeting. The 23rd, well, so we have eight, right here, here. Okay. Uh, at 7.15 so most likely, but I'll the first item on the agenda, agenda for the yeah. to get an Because <coughs> that's not in any of your written documents yet, because oh. it's ongoing. All right. That's, I can, I can stop there. We got plenty All right. Of Thanks. The uh, next topic on the agenda is the uh, reappointment of a retirement board member. That is uh, Carol Roberts, our former HR administrator. You appointed her almost a year ago to fill out the rest of her term through December. Mm -hmm. Um, they have not met since December 31st, um, so I'd ask you to reappoint her for another three-year term. Um, I emailed her today. She's been very helpful. She's been very good. And obviously, her background is perfect for the retirement. Does she want to do it? Um, I, I told her she wants to. <laughs> yeah, she's, kind of, she's a ton of employees she, we have. Right? Whether she's willing to do the whole three years, we'll okay, see. Well, but she can yeah. always quit if she wants. Okay. But yes. <laughs> And I'm told because the retirement board obviously deals with people retiring, so many people know her, there's a great deal of confidence in yeah. that. So she's a good choice. Okay. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, I move that the Board of Selectmen appoint Carol Roberts to the retirement board of the term expiring December 31st, 2020. Do I have a second? A second. second. All of the seconds. Um, any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the proposed motion, raise your hand. Five zero. It's quick. It's one of the quickest things we've done today. Um, next is a the discussion, as Barry mentioned, on our um, policies, this being Article 1, General Operating. Do you want me to give an overview or jump right to one? Uh, for, you, right? for those watching, although it's going to take some time, why don't you give an overview? Okay, just kind quickly. Of, yeah. uh, I'll do it quickly. I'm going to go sequentially through the existing um, articles. Number one is a discussion tonight, General do Operating you want to show Procedures. Something on the back here? Uh, oh, yeah. What do you need to do? You need no, I'm to asking you to put the public. Yes, yes, I do oh. have something. Oh, I, need to do. I didn't realize it wasn't there. <laughs> nice behind the back of my head. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's interesting. That's not on my screen. <laughs> oh, that's on my screen. That's fine. <laughs> that could get you in trouble. I'm having a senior moment here. <laughs> well, I'll talk. Is that you? Yes, thank you. Um, we'll have a brief discussion, or, or as long as selectmen want, for general operating <coughs> procedures. I don't expect to solve that tonight. I just wanted to introduce the topic, um, ask for your help. Maybe one or two selectmen will work with uh, staff to hammer out some alternatives and then present it to the full board, and then you have your full discussion. And this could take a while, and that's okay. Um, Article 2, John Halsey and I have been working sporadically on this, and this is kind of a big effort. Um, you know, we'll bring this back. I'm, I'm going to probably honestly say March, but maybe late February uh, for more discussion. Because, again, this is a big topic. There's going to be a lot of discussion. Um, public hearings will follow each of those, assuming there's going to be changes made. Tonight, uh, we may be able to finish so, Bob, off. on that one, will we continue to do what we've been doing, which yes. is meet? Yes. You know, particularly I think with so. some staff, some yep. daytime things. To yeah, Matt and Jean especially some, have been yeah, helpful. So to get some we'll recommendations give you to bring back here. Yep. Um, Article 3 is, is a continued hearing for tonight. Um, town Council is here to discuss that with you and keep you in line. 
Um, you've had some discussion with Depart Department of Public Works on their policies. Um, I didn't think it was a big enough issue to bring all by itself. It didn't fit in tonight. Um, I'll bring that back whenever you want um, and consolidate that. And, and the last few are very, well, two of them are very small. Um, community services, which is now a portion of a department, and public safety, which really is just petroleum storage. Um, I think we can carve that up and call it something else. It doesn't need to be standing alone. We'll come back with that um, also in the spring. And I, I don't think there's really anything controversial there or, or things that are out of date. Um, you had a presentation last summer from um, Judy Perkins, our HR director. Personnel policies are a very important thing, um, quite honestly, and I say a little bit about it here, and I don't want to say too much. Um, we're in the middle of a project with Labor Council and with Carol Roberts and in the middle of collective bargaining. Um, because of the work we're doing there, I purposely want the personnel policies to follow all that. Um, we have eight unions. I do have some tentative settlements. I don't expect to have eight settlements until probably about town meeting if I'm optimistic. So I, I, it will be most appropriate to bring this back to you, but in the right time. So we'll do that in an executive session? It depends what the topic is, quite honestly. It could well be that you do it in open session. Okay. Um, if it involves unions and collective bargaining, it may well take executive session. I'll ask for some guidance on that. Um, so that's the overview. Um, and you, we can discuss this, but I did want you to think about these different issues, and to the extent we haven't yet broached a topic, if one or two of you would volunteer to assist, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I would, I'd like to be involved. Perhaps some of the others would be involved. Well, which one? I, I can send out an email and perhaps lay it out and yeah. get responses. Yeah. And then I'd, like to, I'd like to do it on whatever number one. Okay. I would just like, like to be involved in that one as well. Okay. All right. Take notes. Yeah. So John, H, and Barry for one. Um, okay. Bob, yep. uh, just because I have some experience, unfortunately, in this field, petroleum storage, okay. as sexy as that sounds, <laughs> um, I'd be happy to help with that. Okay. We handle that gas? through the fire department. <laughs> Sadly, yes. <laughs> okay. It's all the same. It's all somewhere with that. All petroleum. Okay. That's, petroleum, that's petroleum. That's good. That's helpful. Um, we can take um, Article 1 wherever you'd like tonight. I, I, Barry, I know, said he'd contact me early. He has some comments. Um, I laid out some questions and some comments um, very much in draft form, and I've not run this past, past town council. These are just my thoughts. Um, the first comment I made, and I, and I will be quick, um, I cannot find what section of the bylaws matches this, so I just highlighted to remember, to remind myself. <coughs> it's kind of sad that I couldn't find it. So that's some historical reference. So that's a historical reference that got lost, and I'll need to try to track back. Um, I've crossed out something which said these things are not part of the policy, but they're in an appendix. I don't see why it's in a policy, you know, statement or document if it's not relevant to the policy. And P.S. I never found those documents. So another missing breadcrumb. Right. Um, you've already discussed the reorganization. Um, you know, the month of June. You know, you needed to discuss that. Uh, my only comment um, from 20 years of observation is I think it is challenging and somewhat difficult for a selectman in April to speak at April town meeting. I think that's that's a that's a that's a lift. <coughs> Yeah. That's, a, that's not an easy thing, especially, well, it depends who it is, but it's especially a newly elected one. That's Clearly. a big task. Although if they've been well, vice chair and they're yes. sort of moving up the chain. Certainly. It, it's, if yeah. it's someone that's existed and is well-seasoned, it's fine. But it's still, it's still a big ask well, because a, you don't nominate a chair until three weeks, two weeks before, right. three weeks before town meeting. Let me argue the other side for a moment. We're all here <coughs> hearing the same material. Mm -hmm. We're all talking. We're all con mm -hmm. contributing. In some sense, you could drop, you could say, bang, it's you or you or you or you. Yeah. And we'll no one is yeah. any better or any worse off to start from that moment. None of us is, is any more ready or any less ready because we've all been exposed to the same good or bad material. So the only thing it does do to you is time, but I don't think the time element is made any worse or better. It's clearly your call. You, yeah, you really yeah. got you know, the people that have to do it. So it's individual. I happen to like the time pressure because okay. it help, makes you hustle mm -hmm. as opposed yeah. to I get months, I don't have to worry about that. Right. The, in this regard, the, the bylaw states through 312 that that each board committee com or commission shall meet at the call of the chair no earlier than June 1st, no later than June 31st of each year. And so, aren't we obligated to follow the bylaws? They shall in meet. That? It says e each board committee or commission shall meet at the call of the chair no earlier than June 1st 
and no later than June, July 31st of each year and shall then elect its chair and vice chair for the new fiscal year. So it seems to me that that's, and that would avoid the, <coughs> somebody getting elected the chair in April and then having to go speak at town meeting. Plus it's the bylaw, I think. We're I think that's something that you know, whoever's working on this should obviously work with town council. I, I, all I know is to John's point, it hasn't been followed for a long time. Yeah. I have a question. When, yeah, when and what, I know when it changed. Why did it change? What changed? No idea. What changed? Going from organi reorganizing in, in June to- I was here and I have no idea why. Like it, it, some, it had yeah. to have, Someone had a public Were you policy. The town manager reason? Then? I don't think no, so. I wasn't the no, town manager, no. but that it made sense, you know. I don't know. I don't even purpose. remember any discussion or any issue or any. I just happened and, until I saw the spreadsheet. I mean, do do does anyone see a reason not to follow the bylaw in this? Let me see that. But it's not it's not specific to the board. It's all boards and all appointed boards, appointed boards, committees, and commissions. So we're not an appointed. So we're board not an appointed way. board. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. So, so um, it doesn't apply. I mean, no, for, you know, yeah. the school committee they're, appoint, they're appointed it. effective July 1st, so that's that makes sense. Because right, that would make sense. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. So it's right. a school, so, right, that's a, yeah. calendar, that's a calendar consideration. But again, that's so. their preference. Right. Because Does anybody know if the school committee has a prohibition in their policies against the chair serving? I don't know, Dan. Yeah. Okay. Well, they reorganize in June. Right. But do they have school that? School year. But is the chair also? in the last year, yeah. is the chair the last year of his term, like, for example? I don't think so, because last year, the chair was yeah. up for re-election. Yeah, I, 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 mean, I believe they act the same way you do. Yeah. And, I, and this I year, no. Yeah. But, I mean, I think it has... I don't yeah. know what their, pol what their policy is. I don't know if they have a policy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. Um, next, um, there's, a, there's a couple sections in here that refer to Board of, board of Selectmen subcommittees. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the last time that that term was used or the <coughs> construct was used by this or any previous board. So I think that's something you should discuss. What do you think the original purpose of that was? Um, I've heard the term working groups, and I don't know legally if there's a distinction. I know I can have working groups that are very right. different from theirs legally. That's right. Yeah. Because you don't have to obey the open meeting. Right. Right. But we have had groups of two. Yes. Work on things. The volunteer subcommittee. Well, Barry and I are preparing to work on something. But you Correct. do act as a posted subcommittee. I mean, Kevin Sexton and I, mm -hmm. you know, worked on you know firearm safety for Correct. almost okay. a year. Um, so I know we've done it. Yeah, and the question is, what should the policy say to address that, I guess? Um, and, and I just raise it as a question. You know, if that's a subcommittee, you should discuss it and make sure you've got some good construct for it. Um, this policy, I, I will suggest change. It, it says you have liaisons to departments. And if you look at your current liaison list, um, you have some examples of the DPW. Three of you are liaisons for very different reasons. I don't think there's any reason why you have to limit yourself to have one liaison for a department when there might be reasons you each have interest to divide up. So mm -hmm. the language can change or that can just go away. Mm -hmm. Does uh, it say now? It says that you should it, all. It <coughs> says that, you know, the purpose of establishing Board of Select and Liaisons to departments is blah, blah, blah. Um, but. That's not how you do it, and that's not how a board has done it ever. That I yeah. Is it making any sense to have liaisons to departments in well, the first that, place? That's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, I didn't think so until a month or two ago when a couple situations came up where we didn't really have a liaison for that part of town government, and I thought, as a default, maybe it is a good idea to have, have a catch-all. Things that we don't really deal with, yeah, maybe you ought to. Isn't that, that dealt with. isn't that a chance, though, for mischief in that we're talking to departments directly? Yeah. Well, it depends what you do, but I'll, well, I'll give you the example. It's it's public now. Our DPW director has announced his retirement. Hmm. You have three liaisons to DPW. If I wanted to involve the selectmen, you know, can't. Can't in, in the can't. process, I can't involve all three of you, certainly. No. Um, but if we had one for a department, that would have been the obvious choice. So... That's another so example. So another set of meetings to add to your yeah, exactly. calendar during the day. Bob, if we have comments on, uh, I mean, so you're going to go through all these. I'm and just then going through can, my comments and then turn it, it over. Because um, I, I, I had something in that category. So. If if you'd rather do it, no, at the I, time, I don't, I don't, I don't mind. mind. How do you want to? It's up to John. Do you have the word version of this where we could actually? I do. So if you could, we'll go through it today for your thoughts. But okay. if you could distribute it with yours appended okay. as one user, and then we can all do it as color coordinated. Maybe it'll be unreadable when we're done. But. Okay. Um, I think it's been well discussed tonight. Uh, communication is a big issue for the board. Communication uh, technology has changed drastically since any of your policies were written. We'll just leave it at that. 
But I, I mean, but the thing is, what I would like to have happen here is that, in a really time certain way, we come up with a board of selection communication policy, like quickly, because I mean it's it's important um, because there's a lot of communicating we have to do between now and April third, and I would like to see us have something in place where we're gonna maybe it's not a full scale policy. But it's just something that we can just bring to and say, okay, this is how we're going to do. It. We're going to have our own board of select and Facebook page. We're going to do, ba 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 ba. These are the rules of engagement, because I think that that is just critical for us to be able to communicate with folks between now and April third. As a stopgap, though, we could use just as we use Bob as a single point of contact for, say, the web page. We could use Bob. Feel free to disagree. Use the town um, Facebook page <coughs> as the single point of contact that we all direct our contact through in either an email or something Yeah, but like I, I, I kind of like to, you but know. To your point about April 3rd, that's not right. much time. I know, but I also would like to see us with um, our own piece of communicate, our own way of communicating with people. Whether that's aug you know, augmenting that or, yeah. or having a sub page of it and, and having a way to uh, put out material that informs uh, and enlightened. That's, that's communicating the position of the board to the public or individual members of the board? No, not individual the, the members of the board. The board. Yeah. That's the whole point is that we want to make sure that when we're speaking, we're speaking as a board and not someone, an individual. And why, there's plenty of that. And why is that, coming, Absolutely. Why is that yeah. coming to a head now, speaking as a board? Because I think that there's going to be information that we're going to want to convey to the public. But we, we could do that now. You've got to yeah. separate medium from message. The medium right. exists right. today. If well, you're talking about messaging, we could certainly work on a messaging, give it to the town manager, and post it. You have that very quickly. Right. I think, I mean, I, I don't follow Facebook that much, um, but I, I think that it's very important for the board members when they post on Facebook, and it's hard, um, is is to, to, when speaking as a private citizen, not from, we, we should never speak as a board on Facebook except to give information. You know, we have a meeting coming up. You can't deliberate on You can't deliberate on it. Right. On, right. On, <coughs> or, or, yeah, or to, and to give our, right. our, our uh, you know, I, I once made the mistake of indicating how I was going to vote on something, mm -hmm. and I took it down within, uh, you know, uh, as quickly as someone called it to my attention. So it's easy to do. Um, but I, I, I think that if we, could, if we could try in the meantime to keep our Facebook posts to, um, that have to do with the selectmen, to just information. What, what I think that's entirely different. We're mixing apples and oranges. If we want to speak as a board of the public and convey a board position, can do that that's now. fine. We can right. do that now. Yeah. That, yes. Maybe you have a prettier page. Maybe it's dedicated right. not to the municipal side, but to the board of selectmen. But that's that's uh, six of one, half of right. another. If you're talking about governing the way each of us conducts our, our behavior with our constituencies or how we want to talk about it, <clears throat> do you want to visit a gas break and, and talk about it? Or do you want to talk about fact-based stuff that's already right. in the past, it's already fixed, it's just a recitation of fact. That's a different animal. Yeah, I, I think... I, I don't think we should ever opine about what's going to happen in the sense right. that it's a form of deliberation. That's correct. But you can certainly talk about what the past has already occurred. It's already existing somewhere else. You can summarize mm -hmm. your thoughts. And as I said moments ago to Dimitri, you don't check your First Amendment rights at the door because no. you're a chair of true. Order, true. Order chair. Yeah. Well, at any rate, uh, clearly we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. so, I do agree with uh, yeah, you yeah. that we've got an opportunity here <laughs> we don't want to miss. How right. does the subcommittee want to operate in terms of getting inputs from the others? Uh, um, I suggest you go through me, honestly. It's just yeah. cleaner, just right. in case. You so some of, comments I think you through. always have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And if you read your policy strictly, and Barry and I have talked about this, all of you and me break it all the time. <coughs> yeah. um, this is very centralized. Go to the town manager. Do not ever do anything right. else other than write a letter. And obviously, that's not the form of communication these days. Right. So it, it really, this is the section of communication. It just needs to be thrown out. And I would rely on town council it for some right sort of best letter. practice. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I think that there's sort of two pieces here. There's a, there's a board of selectmen communication policy, both to the public, um, uh, you know, just you know, prescriptive, and also kind of what we want to communicate as a message to the public. And then there's just the rest of the policies, right? It's like yes. how we're going to organize ourselves. So there's yeah. two kind of well, Don't you think that's part of this that. section well, that, one? Yeah, but I'm saying there's two 
to separate and distinct pieces. And one is a communications policy. Well, there's and actually the eight or nine separate yeah. pieces of it. Yeah, I mean, you section. can carve up, you can decide, this thing is so important now mm -hmm. that this belongs all by itself. That's fine. You, you don't have to have the same containers. Right. The, the other principle that Bob touched on, whatever we end up with, it can't be so big and so... One principle in life is if it's too big to, to, to do, it won't get done. I mean, we could come up with the most elegant, well-written, well-crafted document that's 32 pages long. We'll attempt it this year, five or six years. It just is too too right. weighty, too heavy. It won't be done. So we ought to pay attention to the heavyweight or the lightweight nature of it and how easy it is to implement as well, just I mean, in terms of yeah. design. Standards. I mean, the two pieces to me that just need immediate addressing are how we organize ourselves. So that's 1.1.1. 1.1.2 and a communications policy. The rest of the stuff, I, I think, you know, can maybe wait another day. I, I, I just think those and, are the things that. And the responsibilities. And the role. Well, I, I, yeah, role I, I meant sort of yeah, the one, right. the one, 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 two, one, one, two, three. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. First page. Um, the please. last couple of pieces, I, I think, are town council issues. Um, you have policies that talk about access to public records. Honestly, I don't know that you need any of that at all. And you have. Um, you know, non-discrimination and uh, ADA policies, I'm not sure you need those at all. Those are well-spoken yeah. now in all kinds of laws. Right. Um, and that's that's my sort of quick overview. Um, most of this section or of these policies needs work. Right. So, One of the things we're going to have to figure out is whether we take this and edit it and use this as a basis for what comes out of it, or do you use this as a baseline but craft it out brand new out of it? Use this as information. Don't, it doesn't get discarded. But if you take a document and edit it, you end up with something that looks like it's been chopped up with the wrong, right. wrong voice. It's, it, that's old, that's new. You get to go through that. I mean, part of what I'm going to talk about and propose basically puts an X to this thing. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. You start a new page probably. But, I, I don't have an so. opinion either, one way or the other. It's just I, I've done this two both ways, and one way is harder, but you get a better product. The other way is easier but, and faster, but it's got limitations. Just as long as, I mean, a lot of people that have gone before us, much smarter than me, I'm sure, um, put, a, put a lot of thought into this and, 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 and ex have, ex have had experience in this. So we don't want to lose any of that. Um, but point well taken. The, the essence of it you'd keep, maybe the words, the expression. Yes, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. All right, so Bob will distribute, I guess, an MS Word version of this. You'll mark it up yourself. Mm -hmm. can, can you merge these? I can either give you the copy I've marked up or just a clean <coughs> copy in Word, whichever you prefer. The, it, no magic about mm -hmm. my thoughts. I just wanted to share them with you. Um, yeah, you can, you can mark it up. I'll, I'll send you both. It. Yep. Okay. The thought is rather than pen and pencil or a PDF yep. editor, just do it in Word. Yeah. Um, I think um, an important question to solve early is, what's the mission here? If there's high priorities, get them done first. We're going to reformat the whole thing. Let's let's think of that. Okay. All right. Just just a okay. suggestion to the subcommittee, and based on years of experience, if a, pup, if a policy's been written and largely not followed, mm -hmm. there's generally a reason the board didn't follow it. Yeah. And if it's working out in general, you kind of want to hew more to what's been working. You can tinker around the edges on it, but well, you can make the policy work better. That's Maybe. the other option. There's yeah. a concept. Uh, in this philosophy called Chesterton's fence. You can yes. look it up. If you see a fence in a field and you want to tear it down, figure out why the guy put it up, put it up. There's a reason. So this value to Andy's point, there's value in some <coughs> we had to figure that out. I have no trouble tearing down fences, but we had to figure out why they're there. Bob, I I not to put you in an uncomfortable position, but to put you in an uncomfortable position. Uh, um <coughs> I, I, I would imagine it's you have f essentially five different su supervisors in a way, and um, uh, I, I would like your views on what you're looking for. F and this goes to the the responsibilities of the chair, whoever is sitting in the chair seat. Um, how much? communication do you want to have on a day-to-day -day basis about day-to-day -day issues with the chair and with the board? Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I, I guess the one comment I, I will make is, is I'm different from my predecessor who dealt, generally speaking, with the chair, and I prefer to deal with the chair and the vice chair, always two selectmen. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It comes close to violating open meeting law, but I, I always believe that two, two sets of eyes, if you right. will, and two sets of thoughts as a board coalesce better. Right. And I like to bounce things off of uh-huh. more than one person. And, and, and do you, so I assume you get feedback, input from the chair and vice chair on operational issues and, and if there's like a, that. well and if there's an issue then I would change that construct and say liaison and chair or liaison and vice right. chair depending on right. the issue well, that's that's fine I, I, I just want to make sure that that the two people report back to the entire board so yeah. we yeah. all know what's going yeah. on Thanks. I, I just I just kind of want to lay out a concept here <coughs> this is I thought about this since last April actually um, and um, felt that we were laboring under the duress of a town that kind of wondered what the Board of Selectmen was doing, a trust issue. Um, and it dealt with, basically for the last four years, not observing our policy. Um, and, and if things go to form, and you know, if, if this vice chair ascends to the chair next year, that'll be five years in a row where we don't It's do more than policy. that, actually. We can't let that happen. Right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to bring that up earlier, but so, I agree for somebody else. <laughs> so um, all the more reason now why I kind of talk about a proposal. So I think the reason for not having a person serve as chair in the last year of their term, I think was clearly outlined in, in some of the public comment, the whole, the whole trust issue, the whole fairness issue, the whole let's, be above, let's, let's have <coughs> governance above politics. And there's a reason why that was in there. There was a reason why that was in there. However, the reason why it wasn't followed is that it's unrealistic. This is a board where um, a lot where there's five smart people sitting up here. Um, I served on the finance committee for seven years and dealt with seven years of budgets. So I felt I was pretty prepared day one to step into this chair and this role. However, there was a lot of stuff I didn't know. A lot of policy, a lot of things about what the board do, does that I didn't do in my other roles as town meeting and, and finance. So, for example, on, on FinCom, at the time, I don't know if they guys still do it, someone gets appointed a FinCom, you get a book. It's a policy book. It's an onboarding process. It is... Used to. Used to. Well, I guess it worked because it trained Good. me. So, um, we don't have an onboarding process. We don't have a mentoring program. We don't have any kind of formal or informal way for a new member of the board to kind of get up to speed really quickly. Part of the reason is because we're always going 100 miles an hour, but there's no kind of thing. So what I would recommend is, you know, that a new, and put this in the policy, that a new uh, person elected to the board meets with a town manager for a certain period of time. We'll meet with the department heads, get a feel for what's going on. Um, I felt prepared, Andy, you might have felt a little bit differently. You didn't have the FinCom, um, but there was no formal onboarding process for you and no kind of, um, sort of way for you to sort of, you know, kind of get, you know, get involved. So that's why it's unrealistic, because by the time you're ready to, to ascend to the chair, it's three years. So by the time you're ready to serve, this policy says you can't do it yeah. because you're, you know, you're going to be running for re-election. So that's why I think it's unrealistic. So okay. what I'm going to propose strongly, um, and I want to put it out here, gentlemen, for you to think about, um, It'll do something that'll that'll kind of sort of have our uh, par- parts one and two of the chairmanship stuff um, really be able to to, to um, come to fruition. One is it's the annual rotation of the chair. Basically, what we're saying is that it, ha- it has to rotate. And two, not having um, the person serve in their final year. And what I'm going to propose is the concept of a co-chairs, not a chair and a vice chair, but co-chairs. It's at two equal. And what that does is that if someone is in their third year, and they are going to, if they decide to put their hat in the ring again to run for re-election, it's now balanced. It's not just one person setting the agenda; it's two. Um, so that it, it gives the public confidence that why is this on the agenda, or how did this get published in Facebook? It, it kind of gets the the whole concept. Of, it, it puts people at ease, and I think develops a lot of trust. The other part of it is that it helps build capacity. Right? If someone is going to assume the role of a co-chair, they can basically get up to speed faster right? and, and, um, and not have to do it all on their own. So um, I think that that's something that we should really think clearly about um, because, again, to me, 
the, the sanctity of this board and, 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 and the reputation of this board is more important than any of the five souls sitting in the chair. And so for me, trust is the most important thing. And if we can set up a system where um, we're going to have a policy that's going to get followed, we're going to build capacity, um, and we're going to have people serve when they're ready, I think we solve a huge problem. So I put that out there kind yeah, Barry, of as a... Do you have an example of where co-chairs have worked on a board anywhere? Here, um, here or elsewhere? Do you want to have this? I don't know that we have yeah. time for this conversation now. We had a whole budget just, just discussion. So. Put that right back to you. Right. No, Come I mean, I, I think on, on nonprofit yeah. boards, it happens all the time. Okay. Um, and so, um, and, and so there could be, <coughs> you know, John does it one day, one week, mm -hmm. Dan, you do it the next, then it switches, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there, there's the feeling that not one person is sort of running the show. I think um, this needs a lot of work. I mean, I've served on probably a dozen nonprofit boards over the last 40 years. I've never seen that done, nope. ever. Well, there's a co-chair of a nonprofit in this room as we speak, so it, well, it can Well, I'm, I'm sure that there is. I'm not saying because I have experience that it's not true. Hi, Aaron. I think what it says, however, is that co this needs a lot of work. And, you know, I think, you know, as important as this is, we've talked about going off into a subcommittee to go to work on this mm -hmm. and bring a report back. I think we should do that. We can start tomorrow if you want. I just wanted to put I mean, this out because I just think that um, you know we're going into an election season. We're going into a, 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 a season where we're going to be asking people to dig into their pockets again. I think it's really, really important that we come up with something that says this board is really thinking hard about building trust. And I think that what I just laid out obviously needs a little bit of work. I think is a solution toward that process where we build capacity um, and not one person is running, you know, is setting the agenda. So it's out there. Um, I'm sure, you know, people on social media are already kind of, you know, blowing it up. But um, that's something that I really want to see us move toward. And, Before we move on, let me give you my thoughts. Um, I think the implication that somehow this policy is responsible for the trust issues in the survey, it, it, it seems in disproportion. If you go back to the selectman survey and you winnow through that, the trust issues were wide and far, and they dealt with it across the board. Um, they've certainly been developed over more than last year. I think they've certainly been developed over a number of years, and they, they come from all corners of our, our uh, residents. I think trust has, has more to do with how we comport ourselves up here, how we speak to the public with respect, listen first to understand before being understood, and try to focus on transparency and clarity. Get a, get a clear message out, understand it, but also cut away the fog and explain clearly what the problem is. That's got more to do than what our policies. As has already been pointed out, these are dust-covered documents in many cases that haven't been followed in years. I have to admit that for some of these, I was shocked to see that we're still dealing with pen and paper and taxi cabs and telephones. They don't comprehend anything that's been developed in the 21st century. Um, they can't, therefore, have contributed to the trust issue. I do understand the way we behave is critically. It's on television every day, on RCTV, where a new version of this comes up every week. But I don't accept the premise that somehow the construction of the board is root to a trust issue. It may contribute to it, but I think it's got more to do with how we com conduct ourselves here uh, as servants of the public and not as masters. And how we comport ourselves and how we conduct ourselves is sometimes often based on how we are organized. And so... Okay, well, let's have the conversation. Okay. Um, any other comments, Bob? It's up to you, you folks. Okay, um, I would suggest we get on the path of... Okay. Bob will distribute the package, as okay. we have with other documents like this. It's tough to make sausage in public. Mark it up, send it back, Bob will consolidate it, and... Um, in particular, Barry and, and John will deal with section one. If we go through the other sections, are there? Is it? I would suggest that I'll, I'll circulate my version, if you will, in a clean version. Um, and board members individually can communicate however best is comfortable okay. for them back, um, including printing it out, marking it up, right. and giving it to me if that's the easiest way. So you can make a comment, even though you don't necessarily right. want to champion the review of it. It'll be incorporated in the review. But maybe it makes sense for. Bob to distribute a list of one through nine, 
indicate which ones you're interested in primarily. Oh, for the whole policy, yeah, yes, for the whole I'll do policy. that separately. Okay. I was just thinking on Article 1. Yeah, but Article 1 specifically, mark it up and uh, okay. down a barrel or incorporate and, and I think what is most helpful from all of you is conceptual thoughts, not organizational right. you know, yes. thoughts. Right. Yes. Aspirational yeah. thoughts. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Comments right. in, the, yeah. in the margin. Right. Thank you. Right. John, may, are yes. we going into budget now? Uh, no, yeah, so article, we have yeah, article three. Resumed hearing. Oh, uh, it's not over yet. <coughs> Thank you, Peter. Okay, do you want to, we have a hearing notice. You just have to reopen it. I don't have to read it again. Right? Okay. Yeah, Let's see. We were posted to op uh, open a con or reopen a hearing um, I'm not sure we best on the subject of board of selection policies, three. Article three. In our Thursday uh, packages, or maybe it was actually uh, sometime over the weekend, Bob distributed Article 3. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Hi, how are you? Um, how do we want to go through this? The Bob is marked up in the fashion that Article 1 was marked up. Uh, rough areas that um, either don't match with the way we comport ourselves or which are out of date historically. Yeah. Bob? Um, I don't know what the board wishes to do, but um, you stepped through and reviewed quite exhaustively all the way up to entertainment licenses. And clearly, you stopped there and did not finish. So, how you want to proceed is your own choice, but I just wanted to remind the board that's where we Thank stopped. You. And that is uh, section 3 7, I think. Yeah, 3 7 is entertainment licenses. Doesn't mean what you passed over can't be returned to. Well, we also had some feedback from the public on liquor licenses, differences between. Uh, uh, true. Right? True. So, um, so what I'd suggest we do, Matt, uh, just, just to get through it, why don't we continue the pass-through and then we can double back on the subject of the alcohol licensing. Does that right. make sense? Uh, just to talk um, briefly, was the alcohol noticed? No. So I don't believe the alcohol policy was noticed. So if the board is going to consider changing oh. specifically ours, we would need to send public notice. Okay. Um, you can obviously talk about it, but at a later date, you'll have to hold a public okay. hearing. Okay. Yeah. On a specific yeah. item. On that yeah. one item. Right. On the liquor licensing, because it's not included in the Okay. Terms. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions on the entertainment section? It looks like it's got quite a bit of surgery here. <laughs> right. So the comments before was that um, we just had too much and you wanted the right. policy mm -hmm. to be more streamlined, so we consolidated um, them down a, a lot um, and gave <coughs> Bob's office and the town manager you know, the discretion to really issue the licenses. If a denial is going to be issued, the individual will have the ability to come t in front of the board and um, you know appeal and obtain a different decision if, if the board deems that um, necessary. I had a question on um, fees number two. That's just blank on purpose. Yeah, um, so we were waiting to see I didn't know if we were going to incorporate fees into this okay. policy or if you would, okay. the board would like to have a separate fee document, schedule. fee yeah. schedule. It's sort of. Gotcha. It seemed to be wiser to have it as a separate. You could edit it yeah. without changing the words. Yeah, most yes. communities do it that way. We, okay. I just didn't know what the policy was here. Okay. Board have a preference? I would, I would. Prices change more frequently than words do. So. Okay. That, yeah, that sounds, that yeah. sounds fine. Any other comments on 3-7? No, I, I like the way you've streamlined it. Okay. It's gone. 3-8 is... Uh, I think that's the <coughs> early opening. Let me find it's it. there. Well, it's, it's been renumbered. Re it's been yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, 3-8 was um, combined down yeah, into 3-7, yeah, so then that? all the numbers got changed. Okay. Gotcha. So that's intact. And then what was 310 now, 39, no change. I guess one edit. Um, so utilizing public sidewalks for outdoor dining. There were some minor changes to that policy that we made. Um, and then Bob in our office was working with a um, license agreement that individuals that are utilizing that space, especially if they're going to serve alcohol in that space, um, would, be, would be signing with the town. And that was that's under uh, now three nine one two that information. Correct. So the license agreement, um, which is 
spell, spelled out in more detail in 396. Um, we'll talk about okay. the actual signing of the agreement, the hold harmless agreement, the fact that it will be revocable, mm -hmm. um, what type of insurance the town will be looking for um, for individuals to utilize this space. And substantively, there really isn't a whole lot of change. So for community members, establishments that are already utilizing this policy, they shouldn't notice a, a difference. It's just we're making sure they're signing these agreements. We're going to make sure they have the insurance. Um, but in terms of whether they're eligible for um, this license, that hasn't changed. This is only for public spaces. Correct. Correct. Yeah, if they want to set up in the sidewalk areas. Any comments from the board? No. Okay. Keep going. And so then 310, we made some minor adjustments. This was for A-frame sandwich board signs. Um, again, we wanted to make it clear that this was a license and not a lease, triggering different legal requirements. So we were just cleaning up the policy to make sure that that was clear. Um, the license being one time, the lease being a perpetuity? Is that the thought? Um, so under... Mass general laws, if a town is going to lease property, it needs to get town meeting approval. A license is revocable at will, and you don't need to go to the no, town. Thank you. Thing. So we just wanted to make that clear. Um, but in terms of where signs can be located, the nature of how the sign looks, that sort of stuff is um, exactly the same as what's in your current policy, um, brought up into compliance with your new sign bylaw. And what was the, there were, the I noticed you, you, we took out applicants must be current on all municipal <coughs> taxes, fees, et cetera. So the reason we took that out is because that was incorporated um, up above, I believe, in Section 311, and we found like, felt like it was just duplicative to have it listed below. Um, but okay. even if that's not built into your license policy, those, those exact words, I believe you've adopted the bylaw. So has the time I don't know. Okay. I don't think so, actually. I okay. saw that someplace else. Yeah. So yeah, I think you're right, but in policies, higher up. Okay. Um, I can try to find that really fast. Um, and we can oh, talk I'll, about I'll the bylaws. Yeah, okay. Well. I think it's really close to the beginning. Yeah. Oh, here it is 311. It's yeah. one statement that an applicant has paid all taxes and fees and other right. money. Right. The yeah, there you go. Right. So, yeah, it's still incorporated. Yeah, great. Other comments from the, yeah, the blanks yeah. right there. I was gonna say, well, yeah, what okay. is the suggestion for insurance? We never did hear back from oh, Maya. you didn't hear back from Maya. Oh, okay. So, Maya most likely is going to recommend the greatest amount of insurance possible because that's typically what they do. Mm -hmm. So, one way to do it because this is just talking about a frames, this isn't yeah. for yeah. Um, individuals utilizing the public walkway for dining the risk might not be as great. And so the board could give Bob the discretion to figure out what would be a commercially reasonable mm -hmm. amount. Um, and he could establish that that, or we can wait to hear back from Maya. And could continue. we just suborn it to whatever policy they adopt? I mean, just ref reference their policy. Maya's? Yeah. Um, there mm -hmm. may be some merit in waiting to hear what Maya says, because my guess is that they're going to have pretty High recommendations. Okay. It's a, you um, put the day frame in a public walkway. Right. <laughs> they are going to put that gonna, number high, ten million right. without question, and then they're going to require an umbrella yeah. on top of that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, to try to speculate on that number, I think, without guidance, is folly. Would you right. think these numbers oh. higher than a normal business liability policy would be written for? Would somebody actually have to get a I don't policy? See that, but I, you know, I would I would suggest if you're comfortable taken out specificity <coughs> in the policy because mm -hmm. insurance stuff changes all the time. Right. Yeah. Say they just and say I, you, you, know, have you can delegate the authority to me or <coughs> technically the assistant town managers in charge of the section and we can be obviously required to report to you any changes. That's fine. Uh, so you're yeah. suggesting I, not to put a number? Yeah. I'm suggesting that if you put a number it's probably going to change more right. often than your policy needs to change okay. generally. So can you just say having adequate insurance? So that's the term commercially reasonable amount and yeah. that gives Bob the discretion. I mean, as town council, I, we would strongly advise that the town be named as an additional insured. That typically doesn't involve a, involve a whole lot of additional fees. Doesn't involve um, any fee. So, you know, this is, again, this is just the A-frame, so we can definitely give, the board can give Bob the discretion 
but we want some type of insurance guarantee. Well, if we're going to, if we were considering using Maya as a, you know, as a benchmark, mm -hmm. we could state this to be the currently accepted recommendation by Maya <coughs> as our as our policy. Yeah. I thought you said that'd be too high. I. I I don't Look, know, but it, when it comes to us protecting the town's liability, too high is not, there is no such thing. thing. And you know, if they're if they're using something, <clears throat> yeah, that, you know, that is commonly held across municipalities, using then public way. Yeah. it strikes me yeah. that that's where we ought to be. I mean, I'm not just trying to make it tough on people because it's not my nature at all. However, <clears throat> I mean, it is my nature to protect the town, and I think that that's what this is about. And so you got to get it right. I mean, what's adequate insurance to, you know, in one person's mind is wholly inadequate to someone else's, which is probably a totally different number from what a judgment is going to be. Um, so, you know, I think if you use a benchmarking tool, you're better off. What about language and, and conform with the requirements of the town's insurance company or something? Mm -hmm. Did you say commercially reasonable insurance was the phrase of... That, that is used frequently. You see that in lots of policies. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be different than complying with the recommendations yeah. of Maya. Have, have we ever, for kicks and giggles, just ever tried to price out one of these policies? No. Like, is this, can is you this even get them? Or can you, it's a rider to their existing commercial policy. It's a rider. <laughs> it, it probably doesn't cost much. Oh, yeah. So two choices exist. One is commercially reasonable and left up to the town manager, or we use what Maya recommendates recommends or reference my I guess so when it changes right. this automatically changes mm -hmm. preference of the board if we use them as a benchmarking tool why not if nothing else it's an independent yeah. standard that we can yeah. it's not our judgment yeah. it's not the town manager and, and I think to Barry's point you know this is on a sign you know which is a rider to an, an existing commercial property right. commercial insurance product mm -hmm. um, my guess is the cost we're not talking about like large amounts of premium for these things, and you know what it does is it protects them and us. Yeah. Okay. It's not just right. you someone's know. not going to chintz on their insurance because you know someone. Right. Uh, no. So I, that's why I just think if just commercially acceptable, you know, com what was it, commercial. No, I think we're going to point to Maya as the as the uh, independent. Will records. Maya always have a standard? Maya will always give a recommendation. <coughs> or a, a rec what if we don't use Maya? We still want to use the recommendation. Well, that's, you could draft my, the policy that's saying, my issue with it, with oh, the if you go self-insured. Self yeah, well, anything. We pick a different insurance company. Well, we could draft it so that no matter, we could say, like, whichever insurance yeah. provider the town is currently using, we don't have to specifically reference I think I would prefer that, Maya. just because you don't want the policy Thank tied you, to a vendor. another example of making it, you know, yeah. wedded and tied. Right. So tied to a, to, you a don't vendor. Want the, a vendor, okay. Right. So why don't we, I, I think How about commercially determined as adjudicated by the town manager? You know, kind of based on what we're using, what we're currently using. You know, we have a commercial policy, so I'm happy to sit here and edit. I'm good at that, especially in front of town meeting. Yeah. So what did you say, Bob? As, as I would say, the consistent the with the town, the requirements <coughs> of the town's insurance company, or yeah. some better way to say that. No, so I, the town is probably going to have different insurance yeah. levels than Maya would recommend that an individual with a license to utilize the space would, would need to have. So I don't think we should phrase it to reference okay. what the town is using, but what whatever insurance provider the town currently utilizes, whatever their recommendation is. For that. That's right. one yeah. option. The other option mm -hmm. is to just give Bob the discretion. And it seems like the board's leaning <laughs> towards. I think the two dots are discretion of the town manager, but reference an external source so that mm -hmm. it's independent and yeah. That sounds to the reasonable to me. Okay. That sounds reasonable. Okay. All right. Keep going. Them. So the numbers will be filled in later. Okay. Um, well, that doesn't let them vote on it tonight, though. That's the only issue. Do you need words uh, tonight? Um, Recommendation of the town's insurance carrier. They could vote on it um, with, a, subject, with, to with subject to okay. us coming up with language okay. around that. Without us seeing the language that you come up with, I think you could vote Trust that way <laughs> if you <laughs> wanted to. If not, you right. could definitely come, you know, okay. present the language okay. back. Cool. I'd like to check the box tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
I don't know, I'd like to do the thorough work to make sure we get the language right, right? We've got to have our policies right. We better have our policies right. Um, I I I'd like to put Bob, Bob's written. What, what's yeah, that just to try to? So are people comfortable with the way Bob's written? Well, they were that giving me some discretion. Insurance carrier. I think I think Agria's got to come back with a appropriate language, but that's, that's she's working of, on it. She's working on it right now, but even if she doesn't, she'll come. It's Oops. subject to our later acceptance of that. So the question is, does does the amount of insurance that the individual will have, does it need to conform with the recommendation, or are you giving Bob the discretion to that's make that decision? Right. Or giving Bob the dis yep. right. discretion? Right. Okay. Recommendation to the town manager in consultation yeah, with the towns. Yeah, works, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, All right. Three one. That's it. Is that it? Yep. All right. Oh, yeah. The keynote's for another day. Keynote right. was already approved. Yeah, I believe. Key. Remember, you should ask for uh, comments from the. All right. I'm sorry. Any comments on the public regards policies that were reviewed here tonight? Any other Art comments? Article three. Yeah. Article three. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dan. Um, do we have a motion? I'm oh, sorry. Hang on a sec. I'm good. Um, Move to close the hearing on Article Three of the Board of Selectmen. Do you want to do that or not? You can close it. And Bob, just we just want to make sure you don't do anything we don't think you're ready for. And we're able to have the discussion on alcohol policy even if this topic is closed tonight. You, was it posted? You posted another. It, um, it wasn't posted. It was posted for another hearing. Originally, it was posted as. Um, <coughs> article three board of selectmen policy article three licenses right so but, is it in or out? but well it's so it's in that but it's <coughs> never been presented to you as a topic right. so it stands the way it is and, right. and in fact your description of it has been this section has been omitted because it's already yeah. been so if we want to change comments for the public tonight and they cause us I, to change our I don't see any topic. harm in having a discussion tonight the question would be whether you can make changes tonight right I don't think you I can think make it'd be safer not to make changes tonight but if we ch if, if at the end of discussion changes were desired, have another here. Just, just have another here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. So so, uh, so we can close this safely then. True. True. Um, you'll just vote subject to the like the small changes we talked about. One, including okay. language about the fee um, schedule as, a, as and, amended. Yeah, as amended. All right. Daniel, I did it already. Closed. Move right, to close the hearing on Article Three. Thank you. Uh, yes. Barry seconds. Yes. Any further discussion? Yes. Seeing none. All those in favor okay. of the motion? Five zero. Any comments from the public on the subject of alcohol policy? Yes. Yeah. Thank why, you. Why don't you stand up? Let Let us know who you are, where you live. Nick Bonanno. I live on Grove Street. Uh, Thirty six years. Been a homeowner here in Brent. And uh, appreciate the time today. And I know we discussed uh, for a few minutes at the last meeting a little bit on the alcohol policy, and they uh, shared a, a document that's in the heart language. Um, so I appreciate the time tonight to try to revisit that. Uh, going through the policy, uh, what I see is some inconsistencies in the language, uh, or the restrictions, rather. Uh, the policy, as it's currently written, has licenses for restaurants and licenses for clubs. <coughs> And we have lots of restaurants, hopefully more. And uh, we have lots of clubs, but only, I believe, four currently have alcohol licenses. Um, so I did a little more research on this. And one of the things, based on one of the comments made at the last meeting, I did some more research on this. And uh, there is a special, there is a separate license for war veterans clubs. And I don't know why the town does not use that as a license for. I believe two of the clubs would qualify for that. And, uh, we just went through this um, on the alcohol policy, and we added a number of other categories that we historically haven't had, but the state allows. But I don't recall one on, would you say, war veterans? War veterans clubs. So, you know about that? Yeah, so it's a part of, I think, it's a part of a, it's a type of club license. Is that what you're referring to? It's, it's on the ABCC. <coughs> So there's multiple different types of club licenses, as with restaurants. So, um, you know, it's a, it's one of the various it's types. A it's a sub, sub right? So there well, are actually it's not a subtype. It's it's uh, it's a Mass General Laws uh, Chapter 138, Section 12. War right. veterans clubs is one of right. six different types of alcohol licenses. Right. Uh, war veterans club. Any corporation, the members of which are war veterans 
which owns, hires, or leases in such city or town a building or space in a building for the use and accommodation of a post of any war veterans organization incorporated by the Congress of the United States. Right, so it is, it is a club license. There's a couple different types of club licenses, and war veterans is one type of club license, so it does have some regulatory requirements that are different than other types of club licenses. Um, I'm not sure if the town has issued them to the war vet veterans club. No, so we just have regular club <laughs> right now where everybody's lumped into one bucket right, yeah. for clubs, it makes it somewhat hard to maybe appropriately apply reasonable restrictions or, or uh, policy language. Uh, you don't want to, you know, affect or overburden one type of club versus another type of club. So if, if the town did employ uh, the War Veterans Club alcohol <coughs> license, then that basically addresses, I assume, two of the clubs in town, and then the other two can be addressed as clubs. And that gives the board the freedom to put in appropriate restrictions uh, for the different types of clubs. I agree. Uh, is, should I, uh, do I understand this, that the subtype or the, the War Veterans Club is meant so that you can distinguish between types of clubs within the class rather than having a single umbrella for all? Right, so the way that the ABCC will get it is it's a club license right. and then they give out War Veterans so, Club licenses. So if we wanted to distinguish, we'd, we could use that. I believe you could. I'd, I'd like to look back at your specific liquor license policy and look at the regulations governing war clubs. Um, also, I'm not. Sh I'd like to confirm whether the clubs, the war veterans clubs here, do actually have a war veteran license. Because the only Probably where you would. I don't think that we do. I th we so how we, did, we just listed? redid this last. You mean a no, license to right, be a war veterans club? No, so the way that it would look on their actual license, it would say club dash war mm -hmm. veterans. So they would have to have applied separately. No, they would still apply for a club. There's no application that's different. They still so apply. So who for would a designate club. that? The ABCC oh, designates okay. it. So even without this regulation in our bylaws, they would still get that designation from oh, ABCC. Right, possibly. So I'd like to look. And oh. the biggest difference between war veterans club licenses is that it doesn't count towards your quota. So that's, it doesn't count towards your quota. Wow. So that's the biggest thing, is, and so that's all done, you know, from the ABCC it's side. Kind of a way to extend it. Um, exactly. It was a way to say we want war, war veterans clubs to be able to operate, but we understand the limitations that municipalities have with their yeah. quota, so these are taken out of your quota. So when we, when we corresponded with the state and mm -hmm. the ABCC recently, Correct. within the last year, wouldn't they have alerted us to that? Because there was a big discussion about how many we had? What we really had, how many we had, what kind we had. That was just restaurants, though, I thought. What's that? No, it was... It was everything? I think it was every. It was no. everything. Would it, would it be true that unless the town called out something, they may issue something that has a name, but it doesn't matter because we haven't asked for different treatment. So if they, if they issued yeah. it with a dash war veterans... Generally, the ABCC is pretty good about doing it themselves. Um, then, the then I would say that's not how they're issued, because they have a very specific quota for us, and it's very detailed. Mm -hmm. And the club license or counter is club licenses. Okay. I we don't know take what the license yeah, document we'll, we physically We should take a look. Yeah, we should take okay. a look. What's the materiality of whether the license is issued as just a straight club or a war veterans club as it relates to enforcement hours all that, with our current set of laws? What's different? With, your, with the laws or with the policy? The policy, sorry. Um, so the policy just treats all clubs the same. There's no difference in terms of our... And until we made them different, there would be no difference, I see, until our policy made a distinction. Correct. And, and the reason you brought it up was so that we could okay. treat them. And you're, you're, point, you're raising this for, again, what reason? Well, because the, the current policy, and, and I'm kind of a neophyte, so when you say quotas, I have no idea what you're talking mm. about. So you're only given so many right. alcohol licenses to dispense. It's okay. the number we can, it, it's a cap. Okay. So that's your quota. All right. So the issue is, as I read through the alcohol policy, was um, as it's written, it, there's no distinction. Uh, a club is a club is a club. And it's no distinction as to whether it's like a veterans club that might be, might be limited in its ability to service their members similar to club that has maybe all kinds of resources or a restaurant. Um, but, uh, it, so that's one thing. It's the difference between the restrictions that are applied to restaurants versus the restrictions applied to clubs. They seem to be very different and uh, 
fairly lax on the club side versus the restaurant side, whether it's the requirement to make food available when alcohol is served and consumed, or the number of hours that a club can operate versus a restaurant. Uh, I think the clubs, uh, I think across the board, right now it's 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, the policy as it's written has no distinction uh, where any establishment, restaurant or club may be located. Uh, it's implied that it's they're all in business areas, but that's not the case. So if a club or a restaurant happens to be operating in a zone residential area, one would think there would be some additional restrictions uh, to balance the, the uh, expectations and needs of the residents versus whatever club might be operating in that area. So those were kind of the major discrepancies that I, I, that I saw. Right. The, other, the other thing, too, from a historical standpoint, and I don't know if uh, how much information is kept in the archives for the town of Reading, I know uh, Caitlin assisted me a little bit. We, we pulled some <coughs> licenses just to look at um, what was allowed, not allowed. Um, and and uh, historically, the, the town, as I understand it, uh, it could be wrong, but the licenses for clubs have always been restricted to indoors only. And the licenses that you know, we could see went back in the 1970s. <coughs> so the, consistently, the town's always restricted them to indoors. That changed for one club about eight or nine years when you ago. Say, when you say restricted, is it in the black letter text or was it a separate, I, I should know this, but is it an addendum to the I, you know, I didn't plate? actually, do you remember? I think it was in the black, under it was like on premise, in, indoors, so did in the black text underneath it. It changed for all clubs at the same time. I don't know when it changed. Not when, but it changed for all at the same time? That that restriction was lifted? No. 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 Uh, as I understand it, and I don't have the licenses with me, but uh, three of the clubs are still restricted indoors only. Okay. And then, <coughs> and then one was changed about eight years ago. Okay. And, and uh, again, this, because there's nothing in the policy about business area, <coughs> business area versus residential area, right. and we certainly have outdoor alcohol service you just talked about with restaurants. Understandably, they're in business areas, but now we have uh, establishment in a residential area serving and consuming outdoors in the midst of the neighborhood. Different, different story. And, and so it's not clear why. It's not clear why maybe that was lifted, or if the assumption is the town always restricted it to indoors because it wasn't a residential area. Um, I believe all of the club licenses have been let this year, so any changes that would occur, if were any, would, wouldn't occur till December of 18. Um, what's the board's will in terms of opening another hearing to entertain any of the comments that we've already heard? Very willing. Yeah, willing. I think we should respond. You know. After the summer, probably. That's a that's an if, that's a when, not an if. I'm just saying. Well, yes, but like. Yeah, I think you're yes. Not now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, not now, but before a licensing season. Between now and December of yeah. 18. Yeah. Well, we, we should always be open to a discussion. I mean, I don't see anything wrong with being Who's open to a discussion. Time. I mean, licenses are all now renewed um, through December of this year, so you know. We have plenty of time, and we okay. do have a incredible agenda packed over the course of the next couple of months. Yeah, not um, not not until we're through the budget. And okay, and I can work with Bob and Caitlin. I'm, I'm, I thought okay. we're licenses, we're club licenses, or um, licenses. licenses. <laughs> I thought they were excluded from the quota. Um, so I'll we should issue that. those war yeah. licenses. Yeah. Yeah. War licenses. It can't be a war if you don't have a license. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I think but it's I'm, be revoked at any time. <laughs> In our defense, I think the reason that the club licenses was eight to two. In my mind, I had this image of of it being a war, uh, a veterans, <laughs> veterans club. war veterans license. We're going to screw this up, right? <laughs> we are. Um, because in that sense, they've got a bit more flexibility. Maybe they come in the morning. Maybe they, you know, it's not a open to the public. But I guess it is open to the public. But it's primarily that demographic that's that's coming. Yeah. So the club licenses are not 
those establishments that hold club licenses are not supposed to be open to the public. No. Only only people that are visiting are club members, members or guests right. or guests. Yeah. Of, if you're a war veterans club member, presumably you correct. are either one of or connected right. to. So you have to give a little bit more flexibility there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's that, going to give us time to find out what right. our real right. status is. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. I also suggest where there's such a small number of these that we <coughs> ought to engage a discussion with them. We right. being town staff, police, right. but Good certainly idea. you're welcome mm -hmm. to do Good it idea. too. Well, there's four, um, there's they four may four have four. no opinion on this. They may have a strong opinion on this. Right. I wouldn't know. Yeah. Good. Okay. So sometime after <laughs> May, we can get into this. Okay. okay. You, have, you have another public oh, sorry. Sorry. comment. Uh, other public comments. Yes. Where do you live? Oh, Where do you live, Lindsay? I live on Bright Street. Thank you. Is it appropriate to? Yeah, go ahead. Now or should I go ahead. Speak. Um, sure. Well, I live on Bright Street, and I am concerned for the safety of the residents. I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents, and that's why I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of concern about the safety of the residents. And I think that there's a lot of but socializing happens, social drinking is part of the culture. And, um, you know, I have two small kids. I see tons of people um, recreating on that road, going down to the town forest. And I'm just concerned for safety. And I'm also concerned for the peace of the neighborhood. I mean, I think all residential areas in Reading deserve the same chance at a peaceful um, environment. And so that is a concern for me. Um, you know, it becomes quite noisy when people are, you know, imbibing and So just to be clear, the discussion we're proposing to have is a review of the alcohol policy <coughs> only. You're, you're talking about other issues like traffic and hours well, of operation. Well, I'm talking about safety to right. people, people um, right. social drinking and then driving down the road. Right, but it's beyond alcohol policy. It's a little bit... Uh, well, I think the federal. Right. Yeah. right. Enforcement part of it, I get it. Yeah. Um, we'll have that review most likely in at some time after May. We've got a pre-packed agenda the next three months. So. Okay. <coughs> we'll notice the, yeah. the butters and let you know. If you if Make sure you sign in tonight so that okay. um, you have a chance to get a call back. and okay. You can speak again and give us your thoughts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and before we close this, yeah. Bob, just, I mean, there, there, there are three or four clubs. It might be really <coughs> helpful before we actually come to a hearing. If staff can talk to the different club managers and the stakeholders involved just to kind of just to see where you know where the boundaries of this thing are right now, you know, so that you know we get some some information. Yeah, that goes without saying. I think. Any other comments from the board or the public? Just the yeah. status here. We closed the hearing, but we did not take the vote on right. approving Article Three. Shall we move to that? Yes. Move that the board of selectmen accept changes to the board of selectmen policies in regard to Article Three licenses as amended. Second. Okay. Motion. Barry seconds. Any further discussion? All those in favor. Five zero. Five minutes. Why don't we take a five minute recess? Yeah. Yeah. We'll stand in recess until now.
last uh, formal topic of tonight would be a, a review of the town manager's budget. Uh, behind Bob is a, uh, a section of the summary that we'll go through. Uh, uh, all of us have been given copies of the document earlier last week, and uh, we'll each give our responses as we go through each section. So, Bob, I think the easiest way to go through it is just flash through this and then take inputs from the group. As appropriate. Okay, I, I agree. Um, this is not um, a, a sort of bottom-up presentation. This board has already seen all that. Um, this is just the results of all those presentations. Um, simply put on the first page, um, I was tasked with making a million and a half dollar cuts from what was presented in December, and I've, I've done that. Um, both the town and the schools, if you will, have a two and a half percent operating budget. It so happens that the town's total budget is the same. Our accommodated costs are going up about two and a half percent. I, I thought in terms of comparing departments right away that it was instructive to remind the board and anyone else that's reading this of what happened in FY18, the current fiscal year, uh, because the town specifically went out and did some things that were described as one-time costs, so money was put in certain areas to do that and then taken away. So if you will, the two-year picture is, if you will, a little bit fairer. Um, a one and a half percent budget the current year, two and a half next year, two percent <coughs> total, and you can see, looking at the departments, most of them are wandering around 2%. Uh, a little higher in the town facilities budget, but the rest not much different. Um, I didn't do the math, but proportionately um, the cuts were made as I thought they should be, and, and I didn't try to target any kind of rate of growth for any department. I really took them bottom up, if you will. There was a time we didn't do that. We tried to give everyone the same increase. Those days are long over. Um, you can see the cuts here, um, finance being the smallest cut because, quite frankly, she asked for the least thing. She asked for one thing, <laughs> and she didn't get it as she knew she would. Um, there was a couple of discussion points about FTE, so I've reproduced uh, the December chart and just updated it for the town manager's budget. Well, my only note there is you have an asterisk in the titles, and it's not referenced what that means. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think the asterisk reference that it was the town manager's math of 37 and a half hour okay. equivalent. All right. Well, this is going to so, travel, so. Yeah. Well, this is just a draft for tonight. Exactly. This is not exactly. what's going to FinCom. Yeah. So. But that, <coughs> thank you. That's a good point. So, um, you know, depending on your starting point, 18-ish um, positions were cut out of the 20 that were increased in the December requests. And um, I'll describe uh, quickly the additions. It's largely clerical. Um, this is sort of the more traditional look at what the budget looks like, and this is the increases for each department. Um, the reason there are some italics is simply what town meeting does or does not vote, so it's not important. But there's the 2.5% increase, if you will. Um, I expect we're going to spend most of our time on discussion and questions and answers, but I, I just want to reiterate a couple points. Um, Bob has brought to my attention that my pillars uh, came out as killers in uh, <laughs> translation, so they are pillars of society, not killers of society. I want to make sure that's correct. Actually, it could be the same. The, it could be. The bollards, yes. <laughs> yes, right. Okay, it's getting um, right. I, I want to kind of restate that while I said, and, and I think the board agreed, that risk is now a much more important consideration than services. Obviously, we're a services organization, and what the customer wants is service. You saw a good example of that tonight. They don't necessarily want to hear the story or the reason. They just want the good service. And I totally understand that. And that's why we're here. Um, but that is becoming an increasing challenge. I am um, very concerned, as, as I know the board is, about public safety staffing. That's something we've you know, held in abeyance as a comment uh, for many years. Um, would it have been better to ask for additional public safety staffing for the last five to seven years and then not do it? and raise the concern in the community? Maybe. I don't know. That's, that's, you know. that's looking backwards. Would it have been better to fund public safety staffing and get rid of something else? Again, maybe. Um, but I'll, I'll tip my cap to the public safety staff, both police and fire, that until we brought this discussion to you last fall, there was much less awareness of it, meaning they're doing a good job. Just because they're understaffed compared to the peers, the results are good. Um, both the chiefs and I and, and their staffs are concerned that that may not be sustainable. Well, you know, Bob, the, the awareness was has been present. We haven't had a catastrophe. Right. Is, is really what we're saying. I mean, it's fine until it's not fine. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like what we heard this evening, you yeah. know. I mean, 
everything's great till I don't have any heat. And, you know, and I, I really get that. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I want it to be warm in my house. Well, you know, you know the same thing is true for public safety. We, we experienced as a group, if you will, a different kind of disaster or emergency this weekend. Usually it's a geographic one. There's a power outage, there's a storm, we can see it, we know about it. Here, you can't visibly see, well, who's out of gas? When I was out there, I had neighbors approaching me saying, what's going on? Yep. Yep. So it was kind of a difficult thing to assess for that reason, is that it's a sporadic problem that's not visually obvious. But this public safety thing we have known about. I mean, we've, yeah. you know, we've had two police chiefs over the course of the last handful of years reporting to us their situation. Yeah. Um, and it's going in the wrong direction each year with the addition. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and, and I think it's it probably needed a little more discussion maybe at the time, but um, time clearly the start was um, Walkersbrook development. No police were added. Police were fired. Yeah, and Bob, I think, Bob, you, you, you just you just laid it out one of those nights in December. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, the Chiefs will tell you, they'll swear up and down, they'll make it work, right? right. They have. Yeah, and but, they and, absolutely but, will. But, but, but your point is, at what, what level of risk are we willing to live with? Right. My mind is that, you know, we've surpassed that a few years ago. So, yep. you know, um, and that's really the discussion and the decision. The only staffing I was really comfortable doing, frankly, was to add a shared clerk between both departments, which kind of seems like a finger in the dike. But to the extent we can get the <coughs> uniformed uh, police right. and fire away from a desk yeah. and out in the right. public, it's a helpful thing. It's that much more. So it's a, it's a very low cost but yeah. high impact right. item. Yeah. Right. Bob, in the paragraph on the screen, you, you say uh, second second paragraph, third line at the very end. I believe we will need. Did you did you mean I will need or did, or we will need? Or would you strengthen that to say I believe we must? Um, you know, it's so hard to project forward, but if, if this is next year and we're all sitting here, my opinion is we need to fund two of the three positions I was not willing to do this year by eliminating two or three or more other positions Correct. in the organization. Right. So that's that's what I'm making very clear. And so I've made next, that very so clear. All the years. department heads know that. They understand that. I, I get it. This document's going to travel to other eyes. It won't have Bob behind explaining what he meant. Okay. I don't know if you care to strengthen the language here. And there. Again, for the final budget going yeah, to FinCom, right. absolutely. <laughs> When you say three, three uh, between police and between fire. Between police and fire. Um, probably two police, one fire right uh -huh. now. Um, my second concern, concern was the town accountants issues. And that's, again, a, a little bit of a less visible thing, but um, I think the board is highly aware of the financial risk and how important finance is to the rest of the organization. Um, to the extent you have a single point of failure problem, uh, she is in, mm -hmm. purely. Yeah. Um, I can and it doesn't replaced. really matter who's there. When you no. have a single point of failure, right. that's a risk right. that you should she not absorb. She has an assistant department head. The assistant department head, uh, he's a great guy. He's going to grow into some of that job. Right. No. What's our juggling act? What are we willing to live with in terms of what he can inherit and what someone else can hire? And there are some options, um, but I do believe that just funding a position, which I was not able to do, is important. What she chooses to do and how she does it may not be clear yet because she has some internal options of part-time people that may want to work full-time, and if they would, they'd be my first choice. So just so you know that there's some options, but there's a shortfall. It's not only a single point of failure. It's probably if you wanted to put a stake in the heart of the organization and you take that individual out, you, you've just yeah. ground to a salt. Yeah. yeah, and in the last 12 months or 15 months, she did proportionally more work in the school department because the staff turned over that point. she doesn't have to do going forward, we right. hope. Right. Uh, and she's aware of that, but she's still <coughs> exhausted from it. Quite honestly. And having an assistant town accountant will not only be a backup, but also someone uh, that will pick up her institutional knowledge right. uh, moving, you know, down the road. Yeah, and, and it's important. It's, um, you know, it's the proverbial Wall Street term is the Chinese wall. There's things the town accountant does that I shouldn't do and that right. other people shouldn't do. And there's things the Board of Assessors should do that no one else should do. We do our best to honor the spirit of that. We don't have the staff. We have to share. We have to overlap. Um, I do things that are legally OK, but a little gray. Uh, I get involved more in revenue projections because she just doesn't have the time. She's always the final word. Um, but there's things that we're doing that aren't honoring the spirit, if you will, of the division of duties. And she needs to be more separate 
from the organization than she's allowed to be. Would one individual satisfy? I think so. Right. Yeah, I do. Well, she, that's what she kind of said, too, when she was yeah. there. That, um, I just need one. Yeah. Um, I, I don't feel obliged to really go into the details of this, um, but I, I'd certainly welcome the board's questions, and we'll go department at a time, I think, is probably the best place. Um, I, I do want to just point out, I did list all the cuts I made by dollars, by line item, just so you'd see them, and explain whether they're a wage or an expense. And I did then prioritize that list, and anything else that was not on the list I felt was worth mentioning, but I did leave out one category that I wanted to discuss with you, and that's something that is funded next year, but is not funded after I, that, yeah. Rock Castle Across front yeah, and center. Well, I it wasn't so I, I, I didn't want to bring that up other through, than through discussion, because you know, if, for instance, you're going to propose having an override and you're going to list things, we don't need our CAS in the first year. So that's a communication challenge, I'll say. And, um, you know, how we approach it, how much we ask to fund our CAS is a discussion point. But I will tell you, and, and John Doherty and I and the chief have, have worked on this, the town absolutely does not have the resources to find 125 or 150,000 out of the sky without an override and say, oh, yeah, we're fine. Um, it's up to the schools as to whether they share and whether they bring that in as an accommodated cost. That's a future discussion, but it's, it's a, an important discussion that we largely have to have as to with and without an override, what's the future of our CASA? At the moment, and I'm on the board of our CASA, so I, I, I share that just to make sure you know that, as is the police chief and the superintendent of schools. So we're not necessarily independent in the sense that we have a, an obligation to our CASA. And obviously believe right, but you're on the board of our CASA because of its importance. Right. So right. Th that's it shouldn't be. So I just out. wanted to mention they're not on the list on purpose. You know, not by if it were put into accommodated costs, it would be split as everything yeah, else. Yeah, it, it would be. You know, we've each used that method for things in the <coughs> past. They've had some social services added. We've had. Um, I want to say it was additional hours for our CASA, and I'm trying to remember if that's how we got the SRO. I think. That's how we put the yes school resource the officer in the budget. That was the community priority. Yeah. So that comes in, if you will, and is taken as revenue off the top, wherever right. it goes, whether like it's in the school cost. budget yeah. or in the town budget. As a community priority. Yes. Yep. Um, so that's the most obvious way, given our you know, framework of how it would be done, but <coughs> it's a discussion. It's still an additional cost that's not right. funded. So whether it's right. included in the, you know, in the override, even though it won't be used for the first year, it's, you know, it's still, I think it was a... Yeah, and, and as a board, and I certainly learned, um, you know, we were too clever by half last time. We explained more than needed to be explained. So that's why I didn't want to start complicating the issue. How do we want to discuss this and how do we want to present this? Um, you know, and it's an open question still. And do I do I recall right that in, is it nine years our CAS has been around? It's been grant funded in part or whole for the... Um, I it's probably ten. 10, and they've been grant funded for all but portion of one year or maybe right. a whole so year. But we've, we've had to contribute a little as we've yeah. gone. So. Yeah. But that's, yeah. In the middle of two five-year grants, the town paid a certain Our luck is not going to hold out at some point. Well, it's, it's legally done. <laughs> okay. Ten years is the maximum. There'll be no more. Right. Unless they find another source that, that hasn't been recognized yet. And, and they could find sources for subsections of their work, but they won't find it for, for who and what they're There's not right. a, a master funding right. mechanism right. like the ones that have been used. What discussion would have to happen to make it an accommodated cost? Would it be school committee? Would it be John himself? How would that happen? I, I don't recall ever having to do this. Um, in the past, um, certainly I meet with the superintendent and whatever relevant staff we each have. Um, in the case of the school resource officer, that would have been Chief Cormier. Um, and just discussed, look, you know, do we want a school resource officer? Where would it be? Who would pay for it? And so on. Uh, and then just bring it forward to both committees, both okay. the selectmen right. and the school committee, and ultimately, ultimately it's town meeting, but finance committee is a very important step along the way. Um, and then, um, as the board requested, I listed uh, a priority, you know, again, without our CASA, um, and I listed wages. Um, they each, you know, in case of police and fire, have a uniform expense. I have assumed 25% <coughs> benefits. John and I have discussed that's a reasonable approach. And then I've given an estimate, and it is an estimate, based on the last uh, tax classification of what it would cost for an average household 
for each of these things. So, so, and I've so a $559,000 home <coughs> right. with the corresponding taxes right. would pay $13 yeah. for one police officer. Correct. And I, I think this is exactly, I, I want to just compliment you on this particular graphic. I think this is exactly what people want to see. They want to understand what you're proposing as the highest priorities in descending order and what it's going to cost. I, I, you know, I think that I think people are much more inclined to be willing to open their tax purse um, when they know what they're getting. And for, so for those at home watching, what the town manager has done is actually for each of the 30 prioritized items, <coughs> highest and lowest, he has for that each line item identified for that average home, as John says, what the incremental burden would be to in an override for that line. So it's essentially uh, broken out in the, in the most atomic form that's possible. And I think that those are those represent every cut you've made. As I, when I reviewed this, I thought that this list matched the cuts that you made from the requests that were you know, brought to us last month from with, your department With heads. two exceptions that hopefully show up in bold behind me yep. that were not requested, but I think they're important. Okay. And I didn't want to micromanage and make someone request it, but... Uh, no, you're, th these are things yeah. that you've plugged and, in as a town manager. would be another example. Yeah, but uh, because that's not... Right. Th this, uh, this year, you're simplifying I, it by, you know... Keep it simple. You know, I showed you the list of cuts. You can see there's no $5,000 ads. I kind of kept to the bigger things. Mm -hmm. So if we cut technology from 25 to 20,000, that's not going to go into an override discussion. Right. I just left that out. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> numbers match pretty closely. Though. So, and so how you carry this forward, Barry raised a, a really important point today. <clears throat> you know, if the board's going to continue uh, and have a discussion about an override, as you all know, the language of an override can be restrictive for the first year to some degree. Right. Now, I would want some legal advice on this, uh, but I assume in this construct, if let's say you draw the line wherever you do, that you just you don't list how many police officers, you just say public safety, and so on and so forth. Um, if you list dollar amounts, like one override we had in the past did list dollar amounts for specific things. One of them was roads. I forget the dollar figure, 200000 for roads. Um, whatever the town may choose to do, first of all, it obviously can't handcuff the schools by education reform other than for the schools. Right. You can't go deeper than that. But in the town, you can. Yes. But legally, that is only going to hold for the first year right. if an override yeah, passes. Yeah. It's important to know that. And the, when the board had this discussion um, 15, 18 months ago, you have to be really careful how specific you are because it removes your flexibility in that first year. What did you mean when you said public safety? Um, if, if you agreed that the top three things are what should be in an override, I would not suggest saying for two police officers and a firefighter, I, I would just safety. suggest okay. for public safety. Well, there's, five, there's actually the first five, but yeah. right. who's counting? Right. And, um, and to, to the point of, of trust, which we've heard a lot of tonight, one of the reasons we heard that the 2016 override suffered, the fate it did, was folks did not trust or did not understand. So for those watching tonight, one of the additional improvements we've tried to make is to give folks <coughs> full disclosure of where the prioritized list of where dollars, if approved, would be spent and the order they would be spent on. And the, the plan, at least from the town side, would be to have a discussion and decide which of those or all of those would be supported on the town side. Again, our limit on the school side is simply to talk about a, a budget line, but on this town side, we have that flexibility. And that's an attempt to give you, the voter, and the resident an understanding of exactly how we're thinking and exactly where those dollars will go. I can't tell you what will happen in five years and circumstances may change, but this is how we're going to build uh, and justify uh, and override certainly the discussion on it on the town side. I mean, my, my, my feeling is, is that um, the override question should be extremely simple. Whatever number we've come up based on our discussion of this and listening to our friends on the uh, on the school committee, the override is, you know, will the town approve an override of X dollars for, gen you know, for general government for and education, the and then there is a, 
addendum that's not part of the question that it basically is the is the fruits of our discussion about this is how we prioritize it. I don't think the question should be no, no. 47 no, things the long. The question is always in the form you described. It's one. Right. It doesn't have to be. It can be a list. I, I, you know, I, I actually take issue with that. Yeah. I think if we want to get an override passed, and we sorely need one, and I think we, I know we need one here, yeah. and I'm sure that our, that our brothers and sisters at the, on the school committee feel exactly the same way. Um, it's my belief that if this is what we need and this is a priority order that we generally agree with telling people what they're going to get for what they're paying is is highly appropriate and it's and if you look to other towns it's not unusual in towns that mm -hmm. frequently use overrides to fund things they're very specific about what they're spending they they need a fire truck please give me a fire truck it's right on the ballot and it's whatever it is, two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. And I would suggest that you know, especially when I reflect on what I read, you know, over a four or five hour period in those comments. You're a fast reader. Um, <laughs> I would it's suggest that this is exactly what people are looking for, um, who are who oh, voted wow. no but might vote yes, you know if they were so inclined to feel like they were getting their money's worth. Bob, what would the question read like if, if it were embedded? Would it literally be a cut and paste of this with some, or some version? Well, I, again, I would suggest it go by town meeting votes. So I'd say public safety as a so group. So line items? I think so. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that you need the specificity of wages versus expenses mm -hmm. as opposed to for the total department. Okay. I think that's the simplest thing to understand. Now. I, I remember when Melrose did one approximately the same time as us, I don't remember the exact wording, but it was two police officers and blah, 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 whatever yep. the other things were. Most of it was education, so it was more general. Um, we could do that. We could say for X number of police officers, X number of firefighters. Right. Absolutely. X number of teachers, yeah. et cetera. No, I, I mean, if you look at those top ten, nine detail. of the top ten Indeed. are public safety people. Because at the end of the day, all this is is a side letter to the vote. It's not binding. Well, it's uh, your winding and your The year voters, one. when the voters vote, it'll be a block of money that represents this and other items, but it does not explicitly direct the spending. And, um, and, I, and my take on okay. a lot of those comments was the voters really wanted to do that direction. They wanted to have that say. They wanted to steer it. They wanted to steer it. My, my understanding is, um, you know, a balanced budget will be presented to the Finance Committee on February 1st. I, I have to do that. <coughs> it will not include anything on this list right. and many of things on the school's list. Um, if an override passes with specificity, my understanding is town meeting is obliged to include those yes. thoughts in their vote. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean they have to agree with the balanced budget that was submitted. Correct. They could change that, right. so it's kind of a nuance. Yeah. Um, and again, that's binding in year <coughs> one. So, for instance, what again? What happened 13, 14 years ago? And I, and I, I don't remember the dollar figure, but I think it was about two hundred thousand, you know, and two hundred thousand for the paving of roads. So, the town meeting was obliged to put that in a specific line item that first year, and there was a moral obligation presented, and it was always followed and increased, that that would be increased by two and a half percent a year. Yeah, perfect, which is much better. Yeah. yeah. So, how would you deal with our castle, which is spending zero money? That's in why year. I didn't put it on the right. list yet. So that I mean. Yeah, it's a discussion. Maybe we decide that back. that's something we want to fund. Maybe one way you come you back with it. One way you might do it is in year zero, do nothing. In year two, maybe it's a topic of free cash, and you deal with it in year three, because the world's going to be different then. Yeah. I, I don't have a, you know, it's not as nice and easy as this list. Now, we could ask for it in the first year and be disingenuous. I don't agree with that, but you could. And then you'd have an extra 125000 but and then if, let's say you don't do that because that's disingenuous, and how do you explain to the voter what you're asking right. for? Um, I, I will tell you that um, there are things presented in the budget that I believe, and, and I know John has a similar belief, I won't speak for him, just because it's not on a list doesn't mean we can't figure out a way to add some things in the future. We all manage our costs and things work out okay. It's not to say that this <coughs> thing will never happen unless the voters put it right. in there. I mean, that's my concern we'll too out. about just sort of being uber specific. Yeah. Is that you wind up doing, you know, budget by referendum, which is never a good idea, um, and it, it actually ties your hands to, to basically solve all the problems. I'm not saying just 
not to be specific, but um, you know, there are ways that you know things are. The world is going to change. So. It is, but these are our highest priority problems. Would you agree? Would you not agree? I might change the order a little bit, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're yeah, wiggling yeah. around a little. You're not making big changes. No, these are things. You yeah. know, they're. Listen, I, we could put a list of 37 in here. You know, but it's, yeah, these are the things that need to get addressed. Um, absolutely. Bob, back to your story about roads. So in that case, roads map to, was it 99 <laughs> on the, the budget? What, what, what does line for roads in, in the Yeah, budget? it was in the capital plan. Capital. Yeah. Okay, so it matches to that. Yeah. So you'd lump these into public safety. That would tie to the public safety line in the I budget. think so. I have your answer. 2003, there was a general override, uh, and then there were debt exclusions, one for RMHS debt exclusion, n new school debt exclusion for question two. Sidewalks are question three. I think question that three failed. Yeah. What was the, gen the wording of the general? Do you have? I don't have the wording. Okay, I can uh, find it. Yeah. Bob, um, so to to, to, be, to clarify what I think you said, in an override we could specify what the municipal additions would be: x many fire Correct. fighters, right. x many police officers, but then there would just be a figure for the schools. Correct. Correct. It, 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 does that send the message that we're being transparent about what the municipal is going to spend yes. and the schools are just giving this is a block? No, no because they have to by law. It's, I was gonna say, right. But I. your question is yeah. well, the schools didn't delineate, so therefore I don't think they're no. being transparent. Yes. I'm voting no. Yes. Is that your, yeah, that's question? a fair point. It uh, is, but it's an educational issue. Too. Yeah. Okay. This whole, yes, no, all no, of this no, is an education. Yeah, double entendre. Yeah. Voter education. Um, I notice you have at the bottom of this page reference to no OPEB, no pensions, no. Yeah. Um, was that to say that becomes your 31? No, I just wanted to say these are town budget items, town departments. Right. You know, you could identify each of these in, a, in one of the departments under a department head, but there are other things other than the schools that I think are worth mentioning. Unlike the Arcasa discussion, OPEB is a real and annual problem. So, And these are things we did address in the last override, you know, sketched out thoughts on it. Correct. And worked in numbers into the total. <coughs> Would you not um, build that into somehow accommodated uh, you know, cost line? You may, and I didn't want to do it because I'm just presenting the town budget, right. the town department's budget, and I'm just, I'm just be very, you know, you don't see benefits here, you don't see debt, you don't see capital. This is the town departments, but I wanted to make sure to remind you there are other parts to an override, except for education, that are not <coughs> on this page. So you're not advocating. It doesn't mean we have to do any of them, but we need to talk about. Okay, so let me play back what I think you said. These are the town light items. It doesn't preclude including or adding a, an OPEB or pensions or capital Correct. discussion. In fact, right. we should right. talk about it. And of course, the school's discussion gets lumped in on top right. of it. Yeah. Okay. And the sustainability issue, I think, hung us up last year. We can't be as complex. Do we discard it? Do we include it in some simple way? I don't keep, know. Keep it yeah. simple. Yeah. yeah, although, you know, basically what you did here when you sort of laid them out in order of priority and you did, you know, what is the average cost of this thing and then the cumulative, right? You yeah. know, if you go to the end of the list, I think it's a little over $200, you know, uh, on the average house if you added everything in. Yeah. But what's not included in there um, is the sustainability factor. Right. We talked about, you know, I, I did the, the algebra <laughs> and it's it sounded like maybe, I may be right, or, you know, off a little bit. Sixty dollars a year per house per year. I, you know, based on that. So does that depend on the size of the list you pick? Or? No, um, it just depends on just kind of you that, know, based that's, on. That's I, I agree, and we've had that discussion. Uh, I'd be willing to live with that number, mm -hmm. and I think it's fair, but it is a little bit um, <coughs> risky as opposed to conservative financially. It's half a million dollars a year for the for one more year. Right. Um, we can live with that. We've in the past said seven hundred thousand. Who knows? Right. We we have pretty good free cash. But then we have our we have our growth that we have growth, yes. which so, and that's that's an important discussion. Right. Okay. So, but I think is if we're going to go out and with a specific number, right? I think it's important not just to say, well, in the year one, it's this per hop because it's going to be for a, a, a longer period of time. And, and and I think our mistake last time was trying to say that this is going to last for yeah. eight to ten years, yeah, can. which I, I don't I, I don't think we I don't think we should. I think we say it lasts until it doesn't, um, but we give some type of a parameter. Like we're not going to come back. Yeah, you got to give for, a minimum. We're not going to come back. You know, a minimum of three years, let's say. But that yeah. no, that sustainability number needs to be included in this, even if it's rough. 
Um, and then, you know, and then the other thing too that needs to be included somehow in our discussion is what our estimate of growth is going to be. Um, you know, I, I asked Bob to do a, you know, just kind of what, how did we grow in the last 10 years? Just, you know, you know, what did it look like? And, you know, we had, um, you know, for a while, obviously during, um, you know, pre to the you know, recession, we were doing two, three, four hundred a year. We had a couple of really good years. And then from, you know, eight until, uh, eight until 13, we were really flat around $500,000 a year. And then the last three years we've exploded. What's the CAGR? Um, well, I'm sorry? Cumulative average growth rate. You can't go by dollars per year. No, I'm just saying, but per, right, but it, but each year it's grown. Less and, than a percent. And what we've, and what, Less than a percent. right, but what we're not, what we're not factoring in, I think what we need to factor in as we sort of lay out kind of, you know, what we want to prioritize is that we have 16 projects that have already been permitted that are going to probably break ground in the next couple of years. That is going to basically, I mean, I, I don't know the number. That's why I yeah. asked, you know, can Victor do a, you know, back of the envelope kind of calculation about if we've exploded over the last couple of years, you know, um, by 40%, you know, over the next five to seven years as these projects come on, will that new growth mitigate, how will that new growth yeah. mitigate it? That's a good question. And do we feel comfortable then kind of maybe going out a little longer knowing that that new growth is really going to kick in? Now, obviously, there's no guarantees, you know, yeah. developer capacity, the market, yeah. the economy, all that's going to factor in. But in 2003, if anybody ever thought about it, which I know they probably didn't, no one factored new growth. Correct. And, and, and in 2003, we didn't have 16 projects permitted, which we do now. So I, I think we need some type of estimate on that before we sort of figure out where we're comfortable drawing that line. And, you know, um, the, the more growth, the, you know, the more growth that I know that we can count on or that, not that you can count on, but that we could at least pray for, the more willing I'm, to draw the line further down I have, because I have two problems with that though. One is one of the defects we made in the last go around was assuring people about future events or making right. some and we're not gonna necessarily be around to, to blame or to respond if those things don't come about and therefore we have no liability. So we're telling people a bit of a what will happen in five years and there's no way we can do that with any sense of certainty. I like the direction of it. I think that's all upside Without factoring in the growth story, this is an incomplete project. I do think we're in an environment where the voters want to be heard on a regular basis. Yeah. And, you know, the idea that, first of all, the idea that it would be 14 years before we go back is just insane. Right. I mean, that is part of the problem today, frankly. I agree. Um, and I think that, you know, the idea of longevity of whatever we, you know, decide to put in front of the voters is very secondary because I think they want they want to decide and if they're deciding on something every year I actually think that that's probably real I think that's you know I don't think it's unrealistic to think that people will accept certain things in a detailed way and then when the next thing comes up they want to make another decision, and it's yes or it's no. But but going out three years versus eight or nine or fourteen, you know, I, you know, I'd rather do a three three year asks than one nine year ask because I think people will feel that they have more well, inclusion. Well, if you the way I read this, I mean, so for example, if you took two thirds of that list um, and had a billion dollars, um, it would in order to be able to take this thing out another two years. You're going to need another million and a half right. in order to be able to do it. That's why Which I mean, means in order to get a million, you've got to ask for two and a half. And then by the time you get done factoring in what the schools are going to need and ask for, right. guess what? You're, You're going to be seven. right back to eight or nine million. And everybody on that responded said, you guys are crazy. Right. I, I don't expect the number to be eight or nine million. Or, or, well, but but I, I, I think, though, that you, you need to understand the longevity piece so you feel comfortable where to draw the line? Well, so a forecast you know, you of a million do a dollars year, requires two and a half. We're sort of between a rock and a hard place a little bit because on the one hand, we need to be responsible in our forward thinking, as Barry was talking about. There is going to be an economic growth Certainly. component to, to sustaining this, um, and we can't hire uh, five, seven police fire 
officers and then and firefighters and then lay them off the next year because because we've run out of money. Um, on the other hand, we you know, the voters will look at us like we have three heads if we we, we come back and. 2019 and say we're looking for another override uh, so so we sort of have to I think find the middle ground that is done this. in a number of cities and towns I know you want to do this every year <laughs> no but I think it's a sign of the times Barry I think the fact that we haven't done it for 14 years is why we're in such a laborious situation right now <laughs> that we have not kept our voters in, informed on the reality of the finances and therefore you know, it's very hard for them to make a decision after 14 years of a gigantic number. But just telling people, you know, one of the things that people told me was, 14 years, really? I may not even be here in 14 years. I'm mm -hmm. paying for insurance right. that I'm not even going to be able to cash <coughs> right. benefit of. But they might be here for three. Yeah. But yeah. The point is it's beyond right. what they can comprehend. So whatever we do, I think we've got to do it in a framework <coughs> that's, that's in the foreseeable future, whether that's three years or what have you. <coughs> the other part of this is the insurance discussion, although it made sense to us, made no sense to the voting public. It was so right. hard, just as a concept, yeah. to get across. To include it here again is... Right. But you have to factor it in. If, if Otherwise, you're going to tell them, I'm coming back to you next year. We need to know about the upside growth in revenue. Right. And right. to the extent you get new projects, we ought to look at that as a delta in new that growth. May, and I get it. I, 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 I think the voters are, are, are capable of, of following this discussion and, and what, you know, what we're sort of struggling with here. Bob, do you have a question? Um, yeah, uh, just so you can lay out what's out there and what's behind all these thinking. Um, we have new growth assumptions that are going up 50000 a year by assumption. By year, That's per not, year. That's not happened in the past. Um, I mean, it's been I, high. I don't remember if it's 550 or 600 next mm -hmm. year, but it's going to go up 50 a year, and that's what we built into our budget assumptions. Right. Already. So, you know, I'm comfortable that it's very likely to be more than that, right. but I'm, I'm not expecting million-dollar years successively. No. No. So there's some amount of, is it 100,000, is it 300,000? I don't know. There's some amount in there that I do believe is growth above and beyond what we're estimating. You had 900, 700, and, and that's 840, the and now you're budgeting 550. If we think the gap is 700,000, I'm okay saying it's 500,000. Yeah. Because I know there's some Because yeah. there's other there. things that will come, come right. back into play. And you don't, you know, yeah. every year it's a different set. The, the idea of being able to do some kind of forward forecasting based on the, yeah. you have to make some, and I realized I realized clearly that there are assumptions not factually based, right. but you've got the amount of permitting done. We have some idea of what that's going to create on the other side. That's going to create not only real estate tax revenues; it it could create restaurant yeah, taxes. Tax. It can create excise taxes. It, there's a whole series of things that tie into that. So um, I do think that. <coughs> I think it's. I think we might be surprised to find out that if we are hoping to do something at one level and make it last three years, we should back into that based on some reasonable growth rate, rather than plug the number into the override. Because I think we're going to scare. I think we're going to. The average voter is going to say, "Oh, you're just doing it again. You know, you're building too big a number." Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to vote for it. Instead of being able to think it through, and go okay, yeah, on the town side, that's a pretty good deal. If I spend X, if I was spending $150 and I got four cops and three firefighters, and then I was spending another $250 and I got you know um, a foreign language you know system going on in the middle schools and so forth. See, I think. Wrap your head I think people go, oh yeah, okay, I get it. I, you know, I'm spending three hundred, four hundred, five hundred dollars a year, and this is what I get. Um, and I do think that that's how this is. If we're going to be successful, I think that's the way it's got to be um, explained. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, could I ask you a question of uh, Ms. Webb? Yes. Uh, I understand Thursday evening you're having your budget hearing, uh, followed by a presentation of what the superintendent called a reconstruction. Yeah, budget. Our, uh, restore, restructure, Rest reconstruct. Okay. Do we have any idea of what the magnitude of that ask is going to be? Um, no, actually, we're there's some meetings going on to get some information to some committee members. So okay. that's happening, and then that. Uh, so you don't have a packet on that. <laughs> no, it'll be presented on Thursday. And right.
whole sure. discussion of it. Um, and frankly, I, I, my, from my point of view, I think that what we put forward as a school committee for what we feel the schools need, right. whether it's for the three years, a year or three years, it's, it's, it's critical. We're right. at a, a very severe point right now. I believe that we need to get feedback from the selectmen about what that number, what you guys are going to approve. I'm sort of, I see you did some sort of math working backwards from the municipal side number, but that isn't, you know, we need to see what our number is, what, what our items are, what that number is. Right. And I'm hoping that that gets approved. Um, and I think if we need to prioritize it so that people can see, here's the 10, 12, 15 items, and this is the order in which, but from, my perspective is if you're going to say whatever that number is, you're not going to put that whole number on the on the ballot. We need an opportunity to to prioritize to, to cut things off. Right. So you're not intending on like on that Thursday to kind of have the discussion amongst the school committee members yourselves about okay, well, like I like I want to do A B C and someone wants to do B G F or is, no, so are you going to have that internal I think we'll uh, in public? Them, but I, I don't. This is me personally. Mm -hmm. I have down personally to, to have a prioritized <coughs> and then and then that that's a number it's number x but yet what gets approved is x minus one so essentially and we've, we've made your budget the, right the, yeah the, yeah the right number is right. 11 and 12 right. from off the bottom i, I want I to understand. know what x is if it's x mm -hmm. so if it's x minus 10 then we'll decide you know what what we won't do what we are not going to restore right. or restructure that makes sense. Services we're not I mean, there, there are two ways to look at this, and this ties into earlier discussion on uh, itemizing things on the, the override. Um, if we put it all on one number, yeah, we'll have to exercise some judgment on what goes into that number. But if there are separate questions for the school and town, I, for one, speaking for myself, don't feel I should be making judgments on the number they want to put forward. Is it? I'm sorry. I don't know. <coughs> if we itemize, I'm less likely, in fact, I'm not likely at all to want to restrict what the schools put on. If in their own best interest, in their own best judgment, they feel that's the number they can sell. we got to hold that discussion until we have our discussion done. But it's, it's kind of more for the 30th. But yeah. There aren't many organizations that get to make the same mistake, <coughs> the same mistake twice. And we're, we're right where we were last year. And last year we had a concept of a well-constructed, risk-averse, uh, long-lasting override that had the best that all of us could come up with. And it wasn't well-received for all the reasons we already know. I'm unwilling to make the same set of assumptions and the same mistakes a second time. Well, what we didn't have was the results of the survey Right, right. Not that the survey dictates what we should do, but it's a bellwether. It sure is a window a, into what people it's a are doing. It, yeah, it's, it's directional. Yeah. No, well, no, I mean, no, one no, thing no. we know is that it's not going to be seven and a half million. So that was that's the, you know, uh, the, the, the biggest the pushback. Right. Um, and you know, the other thing is that we're not going to say it's going to last for eight years. Um, so that's a that's another thing that we we know we can do, and I think we've done already, just just having this discussion. <clears throat> Ten times better job of sort of laying out what the needs are and 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 what what, what our priorities were. I don't think we did a super great job of that last time. I think we did a, a good job of it last year. We've done a better job of it this year. But we're. I think the key element is that the you've got the comments. You've got comments that allow you to to judge where you want to be in that space. But additionally, I think the thought of including the um, sustainability just brings back, harkens back mm -hmm. to one of the objections people had in, six, in 2016. And I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the energy to go explain to people what that is again and get shot down. Um, John, if I might, just, just to be clear what my position is, if you care, I don't insist you put any sustainability formally in the number. We figure it out. That's what, we're, that's what we're, our job is. But I will tell you, without that number, I would have to manage differently, obviously. I'd have to consider risk. Well, the growth forecast will help us yeah. decide what the ask should be, in my opinion. Yeah. If you've got that, you're right. I, I totally agree with that statement that 
to plug in the sustainability number is like committing political suicide with this thing. Um, I, I just, that's I, a personal wish, opinion. But. My only, my only discomfort is I have absolutely no idea what health insurance is going to cost. Yeah. Correct. Well, we never do. No, no. one does. No, <laughs> you, you have to, and you, as we've been able to do, is we've figured it out. Yeah. And in and some cases, that which, which, which we have to do. We will figure it out, but um, we can't plan because we can't know. And you can't budget for every potential risk because you right. can't afford it. So. John, John um, a number of members of five members of FinCom, I think, are still here. And, and I, I was hoping that we could hear from them this evening before it got too late um, on some of these things we've been discussing. I'd rather the board get through this document and then we can open up for public discussion. We're on page you know, five of a multi-page document. I know. So if, if we've beaten 5 76 D pages here. I understand. <laughs> also we'll here. we beat up 5D5. Um, well, I, I didn't know if the board had any the desire to specifically yeah. go through departments. I mean, Does anyone care to what's, jump what's being funded, quite honestly, is a little less important than what's not being yeah, that's funded right, for this right, discussion. Right, okay. and, I, and I feel pretty educated that was from very the, well form, the four together. meetings that we had. Sure. Yeah. You know, not, Those meetings were excellent, and all the things they asked for, you had to say no to. Essentially, oh, almost all. Almost all. Yeah. Not all, but you know, if you've and, read and this document, <coughs> I mean, I I don't have any questions for you, into the micro version yeah. of what you have laid out here for us for our reading. Um, I thought it was very self-explanatory, and I thought it was very clear. And, I do. And I'll be clear: the only reason we're able to add a couple of clerks is because two and a half percent is so much better than one and a half percent as a budget. It's light years. Oh, yeah. And I I wouldn't have known that a year ago. Um, but we had to take our medicine a year ago, and we did. And I'll give everyone a lot of credit for that. That was the right thing. If um, no one else has any objections, I have a number of comments I just wanted to run through. Sure. 5D7 on the table at the top of the page. Uh, I think you uh, 5D7. Yeah. Um, the line call technology, the run rate in uh, 15, 16, 17 has all been sub 400. So, um, the FY18 is strong, and the FY19 is like, likely strong. You identified some one-timers in 18. What, why would the run rate in 19 not return to kind of a sub-400 or 400-ish run rate? Um, because we could afford to leave about 20 out of the 80,000 we had added as one time in the budget. Whether that's sustainable for a second or third year, I can't say. So you put recurring expenses in 18 that aren't one time. They'll show up in 19 um, and 20. I put 80,000 in 18 that were one time. Okay. I didn't remove eighty thousand. I removed sixty thousand and repurposed twenty thousand to buy equipment. Mm. So okay. it's a little higher than it might have been. But those but equipment buys are, are going to recur, or different ones will occur in nineteen. And it I just don't know. I mean, it, it's a question of how often. What's your replacement cycle for your? I get it. I'm just looking at the run rate. It's yep. it's a big tick up, and uh, I don't know if it returns back to run rate at some point. That that's. I, um, I also, a, an important factor, let me just jump down if you want to get into the details in the technology section. I, I accept your answer. I just No, I licenses mean, are going to always go right. up right. Always. 3 to 5% a year. Always, okay. And that's, that's a run rate now we can't get away from. Well, okay. the other thing is you have new software last night too. <laughs> that precludes the need to hire more people. Yeah. And those are going to continue to surface. Yeah. You've got to be able to budget for those and relicense them as they come up. So. Okay. That's going to be an ever-growing. Yeah, the, there's the two types of expenses. 7% was the run rate this year of our licenses. That's a less discretionary item unless we get rid of the license. Boy, software has got no cost of goods sold. It's a great business, right? Well, you yeah, know, when I looked at that... It absolutely is. John, you should give it away. I looked at that same thing, and I made myself a note. Um, and then I thought about it, and I said, what we've been doing, and we've been doing this for years, is we've been suppressing this budget. I mean, all, all the years that I've been a selectman, we've suppressed the budget. Yeah. Areas that we okay. held down, for example, there would be one of them. Um, probably weren't taking advantage of technological opportunities um, because of cost. So, um, My next is at the bottom of 5D7, five, five in, oh, yep. in the words. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, Second sentence, you're going to give a software upgrade to the specialist position? Are we upgrading a human being with new software? Where are you? Oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, and a software upgrade increase to the specialist position is... Oh, okay. 
That's um, the retired former town accountant. We don't let people leave. Um, we have a pretty significant series of upgrades from Eunice that she is in charge of. So rather than pay the vendor, we actually pay her to do that. So no, that's good. I see. You're paying her to do the software yes. upgrade. Okay. I didn't. Yep. That made no sense at all. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. That's what happens? You're right quickly. Um, my next is on 5D9, the table in the middle. I just have a quick one sure. on 5D8, John. I, sure. I, I think it's a typo, um, maybe. And, and this, I saw this a couple times, maybe I'm misreading it. But under FY18 actuals for uh, December 11th, as of, you know, to mm -hmm. December 11th, 17th, like, for example, if you look at law legal counsel, it was um, FY17 actual was 193 in change, 193,000. Mm -hmm. um, to date, it's only 10,000. Yeah. He's way behind in billing us, though. That's July's is, is, bill. Is just he's way behind in billing <coughs> yeah. us. Okay. We have since December got an August end. Yeah, we're not, yeah, we're not doing That's close. not accurate. Yeah. Okay. So, but, so, the, so the other question is, Cash is 200 or not? Yeah. I believe so. I, I believe it is. Yeah. Um, okay. If it isn't, we'll have to ask. My next is in the middle of 5D9. There's something called DOT certifications for HR. Are Department they, of Transportation. Are they driving yeah. around? What, what is this? Uh, it's Department of uh, Transportation. Oh, I see. This is We're paying for on behalf yeah. of people coming in. Our, our people who have Class A licenses need to be certified. Ah, I see. That makes sense. And that goes through HR. Yeah. Okay. On the bottom, of the, the bottom of the same page, you have the, most of the raises you have in here are, are two and a half or three percent. You have the technology director at one. Is there a reason for that? Um, yeah, let me speak about that more broadly. Um, first of all, there's union and non-union. No, uh, union, I can't really say much about for collective bargaining. Non-union, we have, as you as you know, a step program plus right. a COLA. Right. Um, if you see a one percent um, number and everything had been budgeted properly and the personnel hadn't changed, that means that person's a top step. This person's a top step. Okay. So a number of our department <coughs> heads are a top step. Already capped out. All right. Yeah. Um, so, so my, I guess my question is, if that's the case, is that when we worry about losing them? No. I'm talking about sustainable. No, and I'll get killed tomorrow. So. <laughs> no, I mean, everyone knows what the deal is. Yeah. It's the okay. age-old problem of do you want to give up money in steps or coal? It's a discussion I have every couple of years with unions. It's okay. an unsolvable equation. Um, my next is on 5D10. At the risk of making this more complex, you've broken it up into parts and licensing. I get mm -hmm. the licensing parts, but a part, but within the parts and equipment part, you have contracts and services True. and parts. Is it is it too small to break up, or would you ever? Because licenses are going to follow their own track. That right. software is a service. Parts are kind of episodic. Mm -hmm. Contracts and services you would want to track separately. You know, one of the comments I got back last year um, from from a couple of town meeting members is please reduce your detail, which I was glad to do. So this is not a good example of it in the technology budget. There's still a lot of lines there. I think it maybe it's too much. Um, could okay. we have divided this up another way? Absolutely. But I wanted to mostly isolate software versus other things. All right, software plus, okay, then it's fine. I get your point. <coughs> I didn't know if you've thought through it. Um, uh, don't know what that is. Don't know what that is. Oh, my next is on 5D16. So at the bottom of the page, the SI, SHI, got to be careful how you say that, um, <laughs> numbers here differ from those that Jean presented uh, four weeks ago. She described the current <coughs> SHI as 841 and 80.78%. These are somewhat larger. What's changed? Uh, Gould Street has moved categories at 55 units. But I thought those were already baked into her presentation. Well, they were when she gave it. That's changed. Um, Gould Street has been approved by the state. It's now okay. got a projected number. It's okay. counted, but not yet. So we count them even though um, they're not built yet. Yeah, and you know, there's obviously a risk they won't be built. Right. I see. We count them, but they're not in the SHI. The, the state I counts see. them too, just to be clear. Okay. That's not our choice. Um, so that's why it's so important so not just try to hit the number. To the left hand side of this margin is the official state tally today. To the right is things we know about that haven't seen their way into the state yet. But to Barry's point, we are not certain what's on the left will be built. So let's build. Um, my next is on 5D21. A reference at the bottom of the page, the sentence that says the part-time court. Oh, you passed it. Oh, right there. 
Okay. Reference to FY17, yep. is that a typo? Yeah. Okay. I have a hard time knowing what year I'm in. So I, I do it all the time. I keep putting down, you know, 2016 on my. I, I'd just like to back up quickly, very quickly to 5D17 and the permitting activity on that, um, the middle chart. And, and, and when we discussed increasing the depot parking fees uh, a few months ago, um, I had n expressed a desire to look at fees, fees across the board so that we, we weren't just targeting a subpopulation of residents um, to have their fees increases increased, but, but to, to revisit all the, the, f the fees. Um, is there any interest? Is there interest on the board to look at some of these other fees, in addition to just the commuters? We did this, I think, the year before you joined. We talked about, for example, the uh, fire uh, ambulance right. fee, and I think we went through the permitting fees too. Uh, and just before that, we we had an exhaustive list of every fee that town charged. Right. An yep. Enormous volume of work. So this has been touched, um, maybe not since you've been here, but it's within. Yeah. In the last handful of years, it's been worked pretty hard. And, and it's, we it's can do it absolutely again, fine to do it on a regular basis. Right. I don't think it's as helpful for us to do as comprehensive a survey of all our 25 right. peers right. every so many years. Mark? So these have been raised in, in yeah. recent years. For some of them substantially, or okay. they've been out of kilter. Thank you. respond to the ambulance fee we haven't looked at it in two years um, we're very fortunate to still be collecting as much as we are because there's a lot of pressure from the health insurance in market to reduce the fees we collect and we dodged a couple bullets we almost lost three to four hundred thousand dollars of revenue uh, on Beacon Hill last fall so that one I know is okay uh, the others I, I certainly take your point would you be able to return with at least the survey from two years ago and where we stand today yeah. And just the two year old data is closed. I mean, she referenced that there was that we were below. Sure. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. Maybe not in the next three months, but <laughs> just, just to be clear though, when she said below, if we're getting four hundred thousand dollars of fees, a lot means forty or eighty thousand, mm -hmm. just so you know. So you know, a lot means forty or eighty thousand. That's a lot, ten or twenty percent, but it's oh, not so, a lot so of revenue. Right, so it's, it's, it's a big percentage, right, right. but it's not a lot of money. Right. Oh, yeah, right. okay. You know, that doesn't move the needle there. So you feel good about it, but great, you're 10K. Yeah, but, well, but it's, it's, worth discussing. it's worth discussing. It's worth discussing. Right. We add up two or three of those in different areas. Yeah. Right. We so look, yeah, I, I get it. Okay. Furthermore, I think if we, <coughs> and we need to, to have the appearance of some fairness, and, and we've asked the commuters, <coughs> we've really hiked up their, their depot fees recently. So, so, so I think if we're asking them to vote for an override on top of their depot fee increase, we want to raise their other fees. No, we want to re raise these fees. <coughs> so the depot fee is a good, if, a if, different if, animal. If, right? if 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 um, your characterization, I think, is be careful with that. We hadn't touched the depot fee since the depot was created, mm -hmm. so that one was. Terribly and furthermore, it continues to be a fraction of what the MBTA charges a hundred yards away. But, but but you can't compare it to the MBTA fee because we can only charge a fee that we can justify. <coughs> we're still under it by at least a factor of 50%. We're way so under we're, what it costs us. We yeah, can I easily think justify we're, we're charged to a hundred and... Yeah, it's no, $207. Yeah, I just not, want to not say... To, not to revisit this again, but actually to tie it back to the budget in the, in the yeah. actual department that we're looking at, one of the things that you actually did put in the budget, as opposed to one of the things you didn't, was what Gina had requested was that second plan. That is <coughs> My hope is one of the deliverables in FY19 would be some sort of a parking study that looks at the downtown parking, obviously for the economic development we're doing, but also looking at the depot. Is that something that 
you envision because uh, I think that that's you know it gets it to the Jean whole thing. Is at your next meeting, and this is all good discussion for her. Good. She's aware of it. You should uh, watch the tape from CPDC last night and see John Weston's thoughts on that. They're quite radical and very interesting. So, okay. He said in five or ten years, you're not going to be driving the same cars you are now. We're wasting our time doing the same old-fashioned traffic. So, in the meantime, while we are driving the same cars to the same depot. Well, he, let's <laughs> let's rephrase it and say you don't want to go out and spend another hundred plus thousand on a consultant study for some for a market that's so volatile. Okay. So it's, it, it's, well, it's a good topic. It's a good topic. Yeah. Uh, and just to remind the board, um, part of the capital plan is 400000 um, to do some kind of assessments above and below ground for improvements needed in the downtown related to economic development. So parking could be already in the budget. It's a future discussion. But, we're gonna, but, but what potentially by adding that position, we actually have the capacity, the human being that could actually undertake that work, whereas suppose so, we, we could. But just to be clear, we really turned Ann's position as a clerk into that position, so we're upgrading by eight or ten thousand dollars. So there's still a lot of work that has to be the same, but we're allowing Julie and Jean to spend less time on the counter, and a planning person could spend more time. So yes, there will be more planning resources, but it's marginal. It's not like a whole new person. So that was Ann's spot, which means you got a hole someplace else. Right. Well. We rearranged. <laughs> <laughs> Two are doing three's job. In elder affairs. Yeah. My last change was uh, 5D28, um, the table in the middle. I had to do with the police staff. So um, Bill Brown referenced a 1967 survey that had, I think it was 19,000 population, 41. Right. Yeah. Uh, sworn officers. It's just another data point, but it's one that we've cited all the time. So the others are great. It actually tells the tells the more drastic story. Well, it went up and declined. It went in the wrong direction, which ties to the graph we saw. Right. Chief I Sagala. tell you, in all this data that, that I saw that they showed me, I, I tell you quite honestly, I was much more disturbed by 2010 to 2017 than long yeah. ago. Because that's, you know, I've been here, we've all generally been here. Are you kidding me? In seven years, we've fallen behind by that many more right. positions. Yeah. Because we've grown. Yeah. Commercially and and, and, the, and the threat base has changed dramatically. Too. Yeah. It's not just the, the growth. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately. And and the the work the type of work they do it takes a lot longer to do what they it's used more, to do. It's more um, I think that's why the clerk position will at least marginally help both police and fire. Bob, I, I, I hope you can fix the, this next one magically because if under, under the uh, Human Elder Services Division, um, page 5D18, um, the <coughs> Elder Human Services wages are going up only by 1.9%. And I understand that we, you're working with a really restricted budget, but um, give, given that that's a, a growing population in our Community, I, I wonder if if we're underserving that population. A absolutely, yes, we are. Okay. Uh, but just to be clear, the reason for the change is primarily because we are getting three thousand dollars more of a state grant. So there's a more of an offset. If you look, pretty much everyone's yeah. getting a raise. Right. Um, we asked for some money at November town meeting to give the uh, administrator so many hours. Mm -hmm. um, we are, we are able financially because of vacancies to work her more through June and then have to cut her back. And that's been the discussion all along. So it's not quite 3%, not exactly the same. Uh -huh. So is that the, is that the plan? That um, her hours will be cut in June? The June plan 30th? was they were, I, I'm not going to remember exact numbers, so I'll make them up. Um, she was working 20 hours. She wanted to work 28. We got her to 24 in the budget, right. but let her work to 28 because of vacancies. And that would mean she'd have to come back to 24. I know those not, aren't the right numbers. That's the idea. When we should be moving her to 40. No question. Yeah. yeah. No question. Any other comments? But those are all mine. All right. Onward. Thank you, Bob. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just 
most wanted the impact as we see the housing, of looking at that housing profile and getting up to that 10%. Yeah, that's an interesting question. We've yep. seen an increase in about three percentage points at least since sort of my earlier service on the school, uh, the school committee uh, in, in free and reduced lunch, but close yeah. to 10%. And th that's what we use to then j to allow and provide reduction or elimination of fees. I didn't know if on the municipal side there's anything like that other than the, um, I mean, the senior, senior tax, tax relief is about yeah. all there is. Yeah, and that piggybacks on the state uh, circuit Definition. breaker. Yeah. So that's, that's how we get the data on income. Yeah. That's a really interesting question. Um, offhand, not at all like you do for athletic fees, for instance. You have a program to allow you know, forgiveness. Um, most of our fees, if you think of it, are designed at the commercial sector. Most of Gene's fees are commercial right. sector. Our human elder services division you know, has a suggested donation for some things, so I guess in a way that gets around it. Um, and then we just don't charge fees for things you know, should we charge fees for the nurse advocate to go out and visit someone? I suppose we could, but we don't charge anything. So maybe we don't have many free or reduced services because we don't charge originally. Is there free? The person who might qualify. <laughs> That's an interesting question. I never thought of it that way. Have you, I'll give it more thought. Have you done the work to compare the, um, without identifying students, at least identify the addresses to prove that it's from, say, you're suggesting it's from the increase in? Um, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, how has Reading's income demographic changed in the last? Not the year income. Years. Is it tied to the? the I, I thought you were going down the path of describing <coughs> it's high density housing related. Um, I, I guess I don't, I don't know where they live. What I know is, it's just a more percentage of, of our okay. students qualify for okay. some mm -hmm. level of okay. increased lunch. Where they live in the community, I don't really know. I guess I was, you know, thinking, yeah. it is the lower income housing truly doing what it's supposed to do? Mm. And you know, and we have, so. You know, obviously that impacts, it impacts our revenue that we, our offsets, it impacts the, the, the uh, revolving account offsets that we can then use as we go forward. Um, I, I have one other fee question. So I, I understand what Mark's, uh, you know, what you're saying, looking at the fees, but do you also look at like what's the service, <coughs> ensuring that if you're gonna increase the fee, right, that you're still providing the services? We did that yeah. this year, for yeah. example, with plumbing, all the plumbing fees and this, this, the water and sewer fees were all reviewed. Uh, the town engineer compared it against um, neighboring peers. We're kind of at the median level. I guess, you know, it all depends on who you compare yourself to, whether it's a Weston, a Winchester, or, you know, a Wakefield, right? Right, and I, and I also mean like in the building, in, in the departments where you've got staff. And you have staff to support the execution of right. the fees and supporting the economic growth of the community. Right. Right. And so, right, we want it to be easy for the economic yeah. growth to occur and the businesses to thrive. And so, yes, uh, okay, increase the fee, I get it, there's a cap room there, but just make sure that we're still providing the service to allow the growth to happen in the community. Okay. I, I, I will, along those lines, I'll preview something Gene will talk about in two weeks. Um, I'm not sure to what extent, but. And I, I was less familiar until I did the research. Town meeting can approve and must approve what building permit fees can go into the revolving fund, and they've done that in the past. We, out of those 16 projects, that's a discussion you should have. And um, that's something that could be for, put in front of April town meeting is, mm -hmm. are there any projects on this list that should have fees directed into that fund for whatever purpose you discuss? And we'll make, we'll make sure you get a list and see all the projects right. in the past. Are you suggesting you could do it by project? <coughs> yes, you can. And it would be general fund or revolving fund? Yes, and that's a vote of town meeting. But that's one-time money. Yes, absolutely. But those are all those those fees are all really one-time money. Uh, yeah, you'll get so taxes on them if they're building. Right. Follow on. That. Right, but the fees. Yeah, the fees are themselves. And we've used that to support yeah. other things like our economic development director. You know, that's a discussion. There's there's no right answer. There's pluses and minuses right. to each approach. We'll show you what we've done in the past, okay. and you know, you guys. Can well, decide. presumably those economic those projects are going to spin off the need for more staff time, whether they be actual. Um, you know. Yeah, and we're using uh, I think 180 thousand. The maximum is 200 thousand. We're using 180 as an offset. It's our only offset, unlike the schools. Um, so we're not. I'm not as familiar with this. Um, most of that is the economic development positions, but not all. We're using 50,000, I think, to offset building inspector hours <coughs> yeah. to Elaine's point right. to make sure we have that service. Right, right. So, 
should the projects in the queue further contribute to that revenue to stretch us out for two or three years? It's a discussion you should just have. Well, we should earmark it for what it's used for. Um, before we leave this topic, Bob, on a somewhat related note, um, what are your thoughts about uh, an economic development director following the? I'd, I'd suggest we talk to Gene next next okay. meeting. Quite honestly, um, there's a meeting on Thursday where three of us are going to have a discussion. Okay. So the job description may have changed. It hasn't yet, but that's. Uh, and it's Gene, not posted. No, Gene and Jesse and I are meeting on Thursday to decide what Jesse wants to do or can do, and so on and so forth. And today's Andrew's birthday, in case anyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Happy birthday. So, right. so what are our next? I mean, I, I feel like we've just sort of scratched the surface. What, I mean, we're we're coming back on the twenty third, and we're going to vote on something on the thirtieth. What, what, what's our path forward? I, I don't. Um, I'm meeting on Tuesday with the superintendent and our seconds, as it were, our finance people. Um, we're having a duel, and then um, <laughs> a, a duel. Yeah, <laughs> seconds. Just oh, oh, oh take, yeah. Take the knife. But, but, you, but you're going friendly. Though. Don't you're take the knife. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> And then um, I'm anticipating, and what usually has happened, is a chair vice chair meeting of your board, the trustees, if they wish, and the school committee. I mean, you know, I don't know if John's discussed that at the school committee yet, but uh, he and I have had a brief discussion. I know he's away. Um, that seems like a reasonable thing to do before the 30th. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know, and I have not had a full discussion with what your intentions are on the 30th or what FinCom's wishes are on the 30th since technically they're meeting. Um, so, you know, I guess that's part of the reason John and I want to sit down next week. I mean, my understanding is, is that we'll have analyzed everything and we're going to be prepared to make a, make a decision. Okay. On we'll make a yeah. recommendation. The, the actual language won't be formally voted down until we close the warrant, which is right, in a week later. But at least that'll give but folks a notion it, of It'll be a memorandum of understanding. Where we're, where yeah. we're headed. Right. What's our closing date on the warrants? I don't remember, Seventh? but I'll say middle of February. It's yeah. probably third week of February. So, so, you know, absolutely ask more questions, ask for more information in order to help you make that decision um, based on how I've just thrown a couple numbers at you. And the Finance Committee will get a budget that this is the framework for. You know, Barry, at the last Selectman's meeting in December, you wondered if we could put together some of the background. This was a huge amount of work to do in that yeah. period of time. Well, actually, and this is a this and is this will yeah. serve as the basis for what FinCom right. gets. Right. Um, and and I think from all corners, um, the meetings you had in December. The meetings were the only different part of the process. You heard more, and you didn't see the numbers first. Right. So the, what you heard stuck. Maybe and the presentations that they actually gave, which are now on the web, yeah. th those were incredibly um, helpful. Yeah. Good. I was, I was slightly did. disappointed. There was a piece in the news recently, I forget where it came from, but there was an inference that somehow the December work was um, less than uh, less than clear. And I just want to assure the public that I don't think any board, and certainly no board that I've been part of, has attempted to do more as early and as thoroughly as we've done. Part of that, it's in response to, the, again, the criticisms that have come back through the Board Selectman survey to try to be thorough, detailed. Yeah, I know it's 12 hours of video. It's not the most, uh, it's not the most entertaining uh, crime, crime story, but it's easy watching. It's substance and material that you're all familiar with. And uh, I'm comfortable we've done about as thorough a job as we can in a format that anyone can watch at any time. We'll see where it goes. I know I understand it better. So if anybody watched it, then uh, sure they did. Yes, Mark. Go ahead. Can you speak up? We're having a little Yeah. So, sorry. I will stand up. Um, speak Mark Baxter, Precinct 1, Beaver Road, etc. Um, so a couple of questions first. One, um, Dan, I think you were involved with the RMLB payment discussion. Yeah. <laughs> they are sure slow rolling that. We're not meeting again until February. Do you know why? Is that it's, been, it's been the Dickens to get those guys together. Uh -huh. So I, I wonder why. The town meeting last time, the discussion was to uh, really kind of change the whole structure of things potentially. I thought meaning potentially consider selling our No, that was not the no, motion. Yep, no. Well, I think that was its intent. I'd be happy to get Mr. McFadden to come forward and talk about it. Absolutely. Mark, that's not what was voted. 
reasoning behind it specifically was to say that the payment um, is not fair and reasonable and it should be adjusted. And my understanding was that the board, the RMLB board, came forward and said that they would enter into discussions to address that very topic. And if it's not happening, then maybe that's something we need to talk to them about. Well, so that's, that's a separate issue that's not happening. I think Mark's pointing out there may be somewhat lack of, certainly lack of progress, maybe a lack of urgency. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't think that that was Tom Meeting Will. I think Tom Meeting Will was a separate right. matter uh, affecting fiscal 19. Do you have an opinion, Dan, how we would um, like the fires a bit? Is there, I mean, we could sick, sick McFadden on him again at work well, last time. That's entirely possible. <laughs> I'm sure he is. Let me see if he's texting. Yeah, let me see. You would be able yeah. They'll be getting a call. On it. Phil, Phil will be being texted as we speak. It'll yeah. be here. Um, second of all, I think that, um, back to the, the Arcasa issue, um, I think that's a really big deal, especially given how we may we may look at this list and decide kind of where to make the cut and assess the questions of sustainability or not. That is a fiscal 20 issue. So in some way, shape, or form. Put it in, in zero. Almost says we're going to have to cut something in order to find it. It's a priority. That's true. Right. And I think, in the spirit of transparency, people need to understand that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it goes here, or maybe there's a different way to think about it. I just think we shouldn't kind of say it's off the table until next year. <coughs> but, but in fact, you could do it with town meeting willing. You could fund it in year two with free cash and potentially. It's not such a large number. You could do it on a continuing basis until you just. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. I think that's a mechanism to fund it. Right. My concern is that this is a list of it's a prioritized I, list. I get it. And we kind of fall off the prioritized list. Well, but just to be clear, I stated that this list did have some omissions. It was not a final list. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm, and I don't know how to get it onto the list. I right. understand your point, but it's just, it's so. You important. want it as a placeholder. Yeah, I think you can't lay it off. Yeah, right. No, I agree. Um, my comments, the sustainability discussion, the growth assumptions, I think Bob, you were right. I think you, you work based on there's nothing in the override for sustainability, but we know that we have all sorts of growth. There's a little bit in there based on the assumptions of growth, but you can't overcomplicate. That, that's a mistake we've made. It's a mistake not to make it yet. I think that knowing that there's a lot more there, and excuse me, there's an opportunity that that's gonna end up being somewhat the sustainability. I don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Um, in terms of the discussion about needs and categories, public safety versus police <coughs> and specifics, um, I think we've also learned that things change every year. And sometimes the position doesn't get filled or things change, we need a different thing. Being overly specific creates a tough box to work out. Um, my thought is that the kind of the public safety notion, the line item notion, probably makes very good sense rather than being overly specific. Um, and last comment, the notion of longevity. I think three years is reasonable. I would not know what to do if we tried for every year. I just can't imagine the community would retire. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's very costly, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, Time you know, three years ish. You'd be, you'd be paralyzed. She's uh, question. I think that once the picture comes from the school committee and from uh, the superintendent on what the needs are that they're expressing. That's a great point for discussion in terms of thinking about, okay, how does, how does all this fit? What kind of numbers might make sense? We do have a financial forum coming up, and it should involve also the library trustees. Um, we'll certainly invite the, uh, the Light Board to join us as well. I think they always think they're always uh, right. I don't think the Light Board has ever attended no, any. I think they're invited, though. Okay. <laughs> Good luck. So, but they don't want to see, they don't want to see Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Any other comments from the board before we? Uh, so John. Ahead? Yes. Oh, no, yep. sorry. The hour. The hour draws nigh. Yeah. Uh, just to follow up on Barry's point about m how to move forward and to take off of what Mark said, I, I think it'll be interesting to see what the school committee come uh, has to say uh, later this week. We we'll We can take that into account, and then um, hopefully uh, at our at our next meeting. Um, have a discussion, uh, an open discussion for the public to see and, and sort of try to figure out where we may come out on a, a operational override vote on the 30th. 
I, mean, the, I think we're done on this topic. So the only other topic. So there, are, so there, are, and I, there might have been some other. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Peter. Um, my big Peter Whitaker, Beaver Road, is an individual. Um, what is I it with Beaver Road? Everyone is. Yeah. Like, oh, you just <laughs> noticed that. Yeah. Um, my, my big concern is the sustainability of um, the numbers that were put forth there. If you, if you put all the numbers down and spelled out as you have, I, I think that's a great chart. Um, but I'm wondering whether you could do it as more of a funny a police officer for three years, which would be a greater number. But at least the the ads that we're doing here would be sustainable. Right now, you've got the rest of the budget. You heard the town manager respond to yeah. that. They'll find a way to manage through it. Yeah, I, I want to make sure Peter understands <coughs> what this list is. Um, I believe all these lines are very sustainable for three to five years easily. Um, we are not going to pay an entry level police officer 80000 in the first day he's in the door. Okay. So that is meant to be a yep. beginning of career average okay. figure. <coughs> and secondly, um, the expenses are something we can't find. Twenty or twenty-five thousand for one-time expenses when they join as uniforms, that would be freed up in the second or third year. It's not a lot of money, but it's fifteen or twenty thousand. So it's disingenuous to me to not ask for it up front. So these numbers, if you will, are pretty thorough and not skinny in terms of these are sustainable. It's the rest of the stuff that's yeah. the challenge. But. Thank you, Peter. Barry. So, so Bob, I, I, I'm, I'm hearing two different things, and it's late, and I'm tired. Um, so, <laughs> Pick what, which one you like. What you're, what you're saying in there, in answer to Peter's question, was that, you know, wherever we draw the line, we can assure people that that impact on their house or that <laughs> thing, that this is a three-year commitment. Not commitment. Well, sure three is a year. strong word. What I was saying was that these specific line items are not priced in and unaffordable in the second year, in right. the third year, and the fourth I year. See. So what you're saying necessarily then is that we don't have to factor in the X amount of dollars per house. Correct. Yep. You know, on no, that I, on I, that last. No, I would. Oh, I, I would ask for eighty thousand for the first police officer, and I would put eighty thousand in the budget. We will spend a little less than eighty. We can't know the educational qualifications. Right. No, but for for what, what John Halsey's point is, is that people want to know what this thing is going to this this service is going to cost me and what it's going to be on my house. So, right. I, I just want to understand, and I'll and I'll and I'll stop if I'm just being dumb. But so what you're saying here is, is that <coughs> you feel comfortable that this is that that we I, I can't read it from here, but okay. you know that that's a. So you know, at line 10, if you had $127 dollars a year at line 10, that you're assured of doing that through at least three years, right. that suffices. Right. Plus, plus two and a half. Right. Okay. Well, then that's, yeah, then that's, that's all. Okay. So and that's um, that. Then I feel better about. It. Okay. Yeah. George. Yeah, George Catch on uh, Precinct Eight. Do you live on Beaver Road? <laughs> no. <laughs> Precinct Eight. So. <laughs> so I agree with everything that Mark said, and, and I think. I would like to convey that in the next days and weeks, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Because I think, you know, look at me, you know, remember, funny, you've heard the story, 28 years, I voted yes in 2016, I had no idea what the numbers were. Because I believe in education, I believe in public safety, what the numbers issue So the thing is, and we had low turnout, okay? So the thing is, how are you gonna get everyone out? And I think, you know, the, the truth is, we all recognize costs go up. Okay, there are the mandated the health insurance. Well, there's things like technology, the software licenses. At our home, we all run into that. So somehow to relate with the people that all our costs are going up, we recognize that. And they go up far more than 2.5% per year. Okay, recognize that. And then point out, what is the pain that we're suffering? Yeah, we're lucky. We haven't had, you know, a knock on wood, a major catastrophe. So, you know, but we do need more. Look at the numbers in terms of 20 years ago. So we need more in public safety. And I'm not talking education right now. We're on it. Same concept, though. So it's logical. Things have gone up. But we aren't paying for it. We are suffering. We're hurting. And so, therefore, we've got to we gotta vote for it. And I would keep it simple also, as you say, public safety, um, you know, whether you say technology, whatever else. Very basic things without getting into the details. 
had the, the details will be available, but most citizens will not look at the details. But I think they've got to get the you know, sound bites. Well, that's, that's why this level of $13 for one, $26 for two, you know, it's, it's meant to be kind of easily digestible. Not a lot of detail. But I get your point. People in all, we're swimming in it. We're kind of blind to it now because we get it. You got to keep it, I, I didn't want to say stupid, but you're absolutely right. It's kiss. You say sweetie. Keep it simple, sweetie. I don't know. It doesn't change. No, it's not sweetie. <laughs> All right, um, that's it on this topic. We have three sets of minutes. Yes, sir. Move the Board of Selectmen approve the meeting minutes of December 12th, 2017 as amended. Uh, I have a second. Barry seconds the motion. Any further discussion on December 12th? Hearing none, all those in favor of the minutes as written? Okay. Move the Board of Selectmen approve the meeting minutes of December 13th, 2017 as amended. John Halsey seconds the motion. Uh, any further discussion? Who? All those in favor of the motion? Move the Board of Selectmen approve the meeting minutes 